Section 3. Family Matters Yelp, yelp, yelp. My father's work took him to farms all over Manitoba. The company my father worked for had acquired farms through foreclosure during the 1930s when farmers were unable to keep up their payments. As a result, the farms were owned by the company and occupied by tenant farmers, often descendants of the families that had lost them in the first place. My father was representing his company, the landlord. In fact, many companies that granted mortgages to farmers and to home and business owners in the 1920s became property owners through foreclosure in the 1930s. A hard-hearted landlord looking for maximum short-term returns from his investment would not have looked kindly on my father's good treatment of the tenants. On the other hand, the tenants responded well to his fairness and sound advice, and the farms were often more profitable as a result. Some of the tenants were losers and were delinquent in their payments, and Dad had to call repeatedly to collect. One farm had a particularly vicious dog, so Dad would avoid getting out of the car until the farmer came and got the dog under control. One day, when Dad called, there was no sign of the farmer. Dad wanted to leave a note, but was nervous about getting out of the car and risking attack by the dog. He couldn't see the dog anywhere, so as a test, he opened his car door and slammed it again, remaining inside the car. No dog appeared. He decided they must be away and had taken the dog with them. He got out of the car, slammed the door again, this time remaining outside. No dog. Feeling fairly secure, he set off on foot towards the barn. He was more than halfway to the barn when there was a terrible roar as the dog awoke from his nap and came around the corner running flat out. Dad's only hope was to head for the fence surrounding the corral, total panic giving wings to his heels. Dad reached the fence with the dog only one bound behind him. With a mad leap, Dad jumped up and grabbed the top rail to pull himself up out of harm's way. Then, horror of horrors, the top rail broke and Dad fell backwards right on top of the dog. If Dad was surprised, the dog was astonished. He scrambled out from under my father and went yelp, yelp, yelping back towards the house. All the viciousness, not to say the wind, knocked out of him. Dad, always quick to adapt to changing situations and possessed of a quick temper, ran in hot pursuit of the dog, throwing any sticks and stones he could pick up along the way, yelling and swearing at the dog at the top of his lungs. Oops! My father was not a philanderer. He must have had opportunities because he was an attractive man to women. But he was too shy, too principled, too modest, and cared too much for my mother to stray. So he could come home and tell this story without getting into marital trouble. Calling at a farm one hot summer day, as he was walking toward the house, he saw through the screen door that the woman of the house was ironing without a stitch on. Obviously, she had not heard the car drive into the yard. Not wanting to embarrass either of them, my father returned to the car, slammed the door again hard, and then waited a decent interval. Walking toward the house again, he was relieved that the woman answered the door wearing a house dress. Hello, damn you. My father had a quick temper, combined with rather mediocre technical knowledge. But one day, he happened upon a solution to a problem. His car radio was not performing well. It played clearly some of the time, but much of the time it produced mostly static. He was getting more and more frustrated with it. The static was even worse under or near electrical transmission lines. One day he was inspecting a farm across which ran a big transmission line. The radio was acting particularly badly. He said to himself to hell with it. Then he drove under one of the big transmission towers and turning up the radio to full volume said, Blow, damn you! The radio gave a loud zap and came out clear as a bell and at full volume, nearly blowing my father out of the car. It worked fine from then on, and he was forever boasting about how he had fixed it. Side Hill Rabbits Back in the 1920s, when my father was courting my mother, yes, that's what they called it back in those days, they would often go for a drive in my father's Chevrolet. He was a Chevy man, not a Ford man, horror of horrors. And their drive would often take them into the hills and valleys of the Russell, Manitoba area. They would often encounter rabbits during their drives, and my father had a line he liked to use on his various girlfriends. 
he told them about side hill rabbits. These supposedly were rabbits with shorter legs on one side than the other, so they could stay level when running across a hillside. My mother said maybe some of his town girl friends might fall for that line, but she, a country girl herself, said it was a lot of stuff and nonsense. What, she asked, would happen to his side hill rabbits if they wanted to run across the hillside in the other direction? Maybe that's why he married her. She wasn't as easily fooled as some of the other girls. My father also did his best to avoid running over any rabbit that crossed the road in front of the car. He would break and swerve hard to miss the rabbit, sometimes narrowly avoiding going into the ditch. My mother's reaction to this was to observe that he seemed more intent on avoiding killing the rabbit than on avoiding killing the two of them. She thought there should be a limit to the heroics used to avoid running over a rabbit. Icy Highway One late fall day, my father had to drive from Winnipeg to Brandon, Manitoba. The weather report had mentioned freezing rain, but it wasn't until he got halfway to Portage La Prairie that he found the highway completely covered with glare ice. He slowed to 35 miles per hour, and tried not to make any sharp steering corrections that would cause him to skid out of control. A complicating factor was that it was beginning to snow and blow, and finger drifts were forming on top of the ice. These made driving conditions even worse, because each time he hit a drift, it tended to knock the car offline, which was the last thing he needed in those slippery conditions. Glancing in the rear view mirror, he noticed a car was overtaking him at a considerably faster speed than his 35 mile per hour. This guy's nuts, he thought. Then it happened. He hit a finger drift, which put him into a skid. The car did a 450 degree spin, that's 360, a complete circle, plus another 45 degrees that sent him off the road into the ditch. There had been almost no snow so far that winter, so my father quickly shifted into second gear. It was a manual three-speed transmission. Accelerated, climbed back up onto the highway and carried on towards Port de Prairie. After recovering his composure, he glanced in the rearview mirror and noted that the car that had been overtaking so quickly was now driving much slower than 35 miles per hour and falling farther and farther behind. That driver had finally got the picture. Carol Makes Toast It was one of the first dates that Carol and I had, and it was a breakthrough of sorts. We'd gone to a movie and were sitting out in front of her house, and she invited me in. She set about making raisin toast. Though she was later to become a wonderful cook, little did I know that making toast was one of Carol's only culinary accomplishments at that time, the other two being scrambled eggs and fudge. The toast was a success. The slices were nicely buttered and cut on the diagonal for a particularly fetching display. There was a plate for me with two slices of toast cut in four pieces and a plate for Carol with one slice cut in two pieces. The conversation moved along nicely as I ate my toast and she ate hers. I ate three of my four pieces while Carol ate her too. Then she, without thinking, reached across and took the remaining piece off my plate and began eating it. I just sat there, realized what she'd done. She was totally mortified. I married her anyway. Wedding Solos One of the interesting things about weddings is that something invariably goes wrong. Usually it's a little thing, sometimes not so little. A wedding is a complicated event involving a lot of things happening one after the other, a plethora of arrangements for the ceremony itself and for the reception to follow. Everyone involved is a bit nervous, and for most of the people involved it's their first time, or at most their first few times. The minister or priest is usually quite experienced, as is the organist. The soloist may or may not be experienced. Experienced or inexperienced, a wedding gives everyone an opportunity to mess things up. An aspect of my singing career in Winnipeg and around Manitoba was singing at weddings. Weddings of friends and weddings of people I didn't know from Adam. Sometimes they got involved in choosing the songs. Usually they just asked what I would suggest. Occasionally they had some thoughts about what they wanted sung, and now and then I found it necessary to gently steer them away from their ideas. One young woman wanted me to sing 
two songs, With These Hands and All Through the Night. I tried to keep a straight face as I suggested some alternatives. Gad, I was straight-laced in those days. I should have sung the song she wanted. Olga Irwin, my first singing teacher in Winnipeg, told about one of her experiences when singing at a wedding one cold winter evening at the old St. Stephen's Broadway United Church. It was a small wedding with only a few guests huddled in the front three or four rows of that big old church. Things were going well. Olga had sung her first solo, and it was time for the ring ceremony. This is one of the points where things can go wrong. The best man sometimes forgets the ring or rings, or forgets which pocket he put them in, or drops one or both rings as he fumbles them out of his pocket. That's what happened on this occasion. The best man dropped the ring as he pulled it out of his pocket. There was a small clink as the ring hit the old hardwood floor, then a rolling sound as everyone held their breath and listened in horror, then silence. The best man immediately started looking for the ring, hoping to salvage the situation with the least possible disruption. He couldn't find it. The groom and the minister joined in without success. A couple of guests came forward and began looking. No luck. Eventually, everyone, bride, groom, bridesmaids, guests, soloists, organists, everyone was down on their hands and knees searching for that ring. This went on for half an hour until someone found it under a radiator over against the wall. Then everyone got up, dusted themselves off, and resumed their positions, and the ceremony got going again. One of my memorable experiences happened when I was singing at a wedding in a small church in East Kildonan, a part of Greater Winnipeg. It had been made clear at the rehearsal that the signal light for letting the organist know when to start the wedding march wasn't working. This meant that when the bride arrived and was ready to begin her march down the aisle, one of the ushers would have to go down the stairs at the back of the church, through the basement under the sanctuary, up the stairs beside the organ, signal to the organist that the bride was ready, back through the basement, up the stairs to the lobby, and take his place beside the other usher, where the two of them would lead the slow, solemn, dignified march up the aisle. All this had to be done quickly and quietly. The usher designated to do this got most of it right. He did a fine job of running quickly and quietly down and through the basement, up the stairs to alert the organist, and back to his place beside his fellow usher. Unfortunately, at that point, the two of them forgot the bit about the march being slow, solemn, and dignified. They were tall, strapping young men, and they charged up the aisle of that small church in, I swear, not more than five strides. Their speed left women's hats at a tilt, men's ties awry, and the minister cowering in fear lest he be knocked arse over tea kettle into the choir loft behind him. They thundered into position beside the groom and best man, just as the bride was lifting her left foot for her first step. It was an impressive display of athleticism. On another occasion, I was to sing at a wedding in a big Catholic church, also in East Kildonan. I had a lot of fun singing at weddings in East Kildonan. I was to sing only one solo. It was to be the three-verse wedding standard, O Perfect Love. The organist told me at the rehearsal the night before that the priest didn't have much regard for soloists and would probably interrupt me after the first verse, and that would be it. I said, if you're willing, let's both step up the volume and keep going. A gleam appeared in her eye, and she nodded. That's exactly what happened. I finished the first verse, and the priest started into his chant. But the organist, with a look of grim satisfaction on her face, pulled out three or four more stops on the organ, and we blasted into the second verse with the rafters shaking. The priest had no choice but to stand there while the organ roared, and I shouted my way through the rest of the song. It was a sacred moment. Singing All singers and other musicians talk about being nervous before a performance. They say that being nervous gets the adrenaline flowing and is a necessary precursor to a good performance. It may be necessary, but I never enjoyed it. In the moments before going up on stage, I could never understand how I could have been stupid enough to get myself into such a situation. It was agony. No matter how much I prepared, memorized, and practiced, it was never enough. I was always worried that my mind would go blank and I wouldn't be able to remember anything. That's why I enjoyed singing duets and in choirs and quartets so much. I wasn't so exposed and alone on the stage. I had others beside me for support. I also find it less nerve-wracking singing folk songs while accompanying myself on the guitar. I also had two singing teachers in Winnipeg, Olga Irwin and Bert Whiteman. 
Both were fine singers, Olga a soprano and Bert a baritone. Bert had had a national show on CBC Radio earlier in his career. Their singing techniques were very different. Olga emphasized performance. I sang bass in her church choir at Chalmers United in Winnipeg's West End, so she got me singing solos in church. She also got me singing duets with a very good soprano, Coralie Standing, also in the choir. She found singing gigs for me as well as for Coralie and me together. Olga also got the choir to put on musical shows in the church and elsewhere in the city. The lessons with Bert focused much more on technique, and I am grateful for that. Through Bert, I learned about breath control, strengthening the abdominal muscles in order to better sustain a note. Bert had perfect pitch. He would hear a car horn and would challenge me to say which notes made up the chord it played. He would say, It's E flat and G, of course, can't you hear that? He would claim I just wasn't concentrating hard enough. Bert could sing any note right on pitch and recognize and name any note or chord instantly or tell immediately when a piano was out of tune. All pushed me into performing and helped me to gain confidence in front of a crowd. Olga's contribution and Bert's wonderful training in producing a good vocal sound were invaluable to me as I continued to make singing an important part of my life. Bert's teaching of technique was wonderful and included breath control, diction, singing on pitch, and keeping good time. He got me singing classical music, including oratorio and opera, as well as other good quality folk and traditional music. He also got me involved in competing in the Manitoba, then the Winnipeg Music Festival. Bert was blind, so he had to memorize everything he sang, words and music. As a result, his memory was prodigious. Sighted people don't have the same necessity of developing their memories. At least that's my excuse. If I may speak plainly at this juncture, Bert did not inspire confidence the way Olga did. For example, I was competing in a festival competition for baritone voice one day and forgot the words to the beginning of the third verse. I recovered and finished, but it was very embarrassing. Bert couldn't believe it, and from then on, whenever I was about to go up and sing something, he would lean over and whisper, Now I hope you don't forget your words. Good thing I saw the humor of the situation, and good thing confidence-boosting Olga was my first singing teacher, not Bert. My singing career. My singing career involved voice lessons, singing in high school and church choirs, festival competitions, concerts, solos, duet and quartet work, singing at weddings and funerals, and later, when the folk songs of the 1960s arrived, playing a guitar to accompany myself and lead sing songs. I made some pocket money singing at weddings where the payment might be as much as $50 for the soloist and $25 for the organist but more commonly $25 and $10 respectively. I remember one occasion when the pay was so meager that we were driven, albeit briefly, to a life of crime. We had been invited to perform at a St. David's Day dinner in Winnipeg. Coralie Standing and I were to sing two or three duets with her husband John accompanying us on the piano. The event was being held in the Masonic Temple in Winnipeg. It was a cold winter night and we were directed to the cloakroom where we removed our outer wear. We then had to sit out in the hall for 20 to 30 minutes while the proceedings took place inside. Eventually, we were invited into the dining room for our performance. We were introduced before we performed and thanked afterwards, and John was handed the always welcome envelope as we left. Back in the cloakroom, John peeked into the envelope. It contained $5, which according to my calculations, worked out to two dollars each for Coralie and me, and one dollar for John. Coralie and I were disgusted, but John, always a man of action, decided to do something about it. <clears throat> there were several bottles of hard liquor on the table, and John found that an unopened bottle of rye whiskey would fit quite nicely into his music case. It was at this point that John became a thief, and I became an accessory to theft. Coralie was shocked, but didn't do anything to stop him, so she became a less common kind of criminal, known as a shocked accessory to theft. We then returned to John and Corley's home for a drink. Rye whiskey is not my favorite kind of hard liquor, but we found that night that stolen rye whiskey can taste rather good. The experience gave me a new cultural insight. It seems that the Scots have been unfairly maligned for their frugality, while the Welsh have been flying under the radar, cheapskate-wise. 
No self-respecting Scott would have given three performers only five dollars to divide among themselves. Had we been performing at a Robbie Burns dinner that evening, I'm sure there would have been another dollar in that envelope. Guitarist As a teenager, I got ripped off when I paid $25 for a used guitar at a Winnipeg music store. The guitar had a warped neck. It was impossible to play. I didn't know any better and struggled month after month trying to play it. Even when I pressed so hard it killed my fingers, I couldn't make a good sound. I gave up, concluding that I didn't have what it takes to play the guitar and got rid of it. Years later, when the folk song craze hit in the 1960s, my wife Carol, who is musical and plays the piano and sings, thought she'd like to learn the guitar. I bought her one for her birthday and started to teach her what I remembered from my struggles with the defective guitar years before. She found it a lot more difficult than she expected and decided she didn't need another big challenge just then. I took the guitar from her to demonstrate how to play it and got a shock. All the struggles I had gone through with that horrible guitar with the warped neck had not been in vain. I found that I could play Carol's guitar quite easily. I'm afraid at that point she lost her birthday present as I took over the guitar and started playing and singing the folk songs of the period. I used that guitar a lot after that, leading sing-songs in various 4-H workshops and camps all over Saskatchewan. Upon winning a Commonwealth scholarship in 1973 to visit 4-H programs in other countries, I took the guitar with me to the Caribbean and left it with my host family in Barbados when one of their kids showed an interest in learning to play. After we finished our Africa stint and moved to Ottawa, I decided to take guitar lessons for the first time. I found a good guitar teacher, bought a good guitar, and had a few pleasant years playing guitar in Ottawa. Initially, the experience wasn't as good as on the prairies, however. There's a different mix of sing-along songs in Ontario. Eventually, I developed a repertoire of folk, rock, and traditional songs that are quite well received at various open mic venues around Ottawa. Not getting our bacon, you're not. We were camping somewhere deep in the Rocky Mountains. It was morning and our little kids were running around the campsite while Carol cooked breakfast. We had our trusty Coleman stove set up beside our camper trailer on a wooden tent platform. Carol was frying bacon when a bear approached with the idea of commandeering our bacon for himself. Carol is very fond of bacon and of her kids, not necessarily in that order. She wasn't about to let any upstart bear get his paws on either, so she picked up a rock, took a step toward the bear, and threw the rock hard onto the boards in front of him, and said, get out of here, in a very menacing tone. The bear turned away, no doubt to look elsewhere for a less threatening camp mother. Just then a camp warden drove up in his truck to help us out. As soon as the bear saw the truck, he took off into the woods. First a mad woman who threw rocks, then the warden who was not above shooting tranquilizer darts into his rear end. There was a rifle hanging in the cab. This day was not starting off well for one particular bear. Best Christmas Ever For a number of years, my parents were on a Christmas visiting cycle. Their home was in Winnipeg, so one year they would travel to visit my sister and her family in Edmonton. The next year they would spend Christmas with me and my family in Saskatoon. However, in 1966, my father had surgery for cancer in the fall and was not well enough to make the trip to Saskatoon. It seemed inevitable that my father and mother would be spending a rather bleak Christmas alone. Carol and I hatched a plan, more of a conspiracy actually, we would drive the 500 miles from Saskatoon to Winnipeg and spend Christmas there. The plan was to be kept secret from my father, a rather elaborate Christmas present, if you will. A 500 mile drive across the prairies in the dead of winter in those days was not a trivial undertaking, and I was fairly concerned about it. With a wife and three kids in the car, I felt the responsibility. If there was the threat of a blizzard developing anywhere along the route, we would have to delay or cancel the trip. My other concern was possible problems with the car, a flat tire or mechanical problems. I've always kept our cars well serviced and in good shape, but they weren't as reliable at that time as they are today. Fortunately, we had good driving conditions on the way there and arrived at my parents' store in the late afternoon of the, of the 23rd. 
The boys went to the door and rang the bell. Dad opened the door and the boys stepped into the front hall. Dad stepped back and couldn't take in just what had happened. He gaped at these two grandsons without speaking. When it finally sunk in what was going on, he retreated around the corner, sniffing loudly. Mum, who was in on the surprise, took over welcoming us all into the house while my father composed himself. It was a special Christmas, made more so because of the surprise and my father's life-threatening condition. It was the gift of presents. Son David counts it as the best Christmas ever. Camping in the Prairies For several years we used our Saskatoon home as a base for family vacations in the Rockies and British Columbia. Later, we began to stay closer to home and explore our own province of Saskatchewan. We visited Cypress Hills Provincial Park in the southwest, the Badlands south of Moose Jaw, Lake Diefenbaker, the lake created when the Gardner Dam was built across the South Saskatchewan River, the northeast with its spruce woods and lakes, and the area north of Prince Albert as far as La Ronge, as well as the country north of North Battleford, including Meadow Lake Provincial Park. At first glance, the farming area of the prairies would seem to be a less desirable place to camp than the Rocky Mountains or the more forested areas on the fringes of the farmland. Certainly from our base in Saskatoon, our family camped in the Rockies and throughout BC, including the farthest reaches of Vancouver Island. We also went north and east into BC's forest country. Then mainly because it was closer to home, we tried a couple of camping trips in Saskatchewan and we were surprised at how much fun we had. The soil of the Northwest gave us sandier beaches, sandy bottom rivers and lakes, and nicer ground for camping. Our experience was that the weather in the Northwest was warmer and drier than in the Northeast. We had some pleasant times camping in Northwest Saskatchewan. The agriculture region of the Canadian prairies is shaped like a large triangle, running from the Canada-US border south of Winnipeg, northwest to the Peace River country north of Edmonton, then south through Calgary to the US border. The land and climate in this huge triangle is suitable for both cultivation of crops and the raising of livestock. The territory to the northeast of the triangle is much less suitable for agriculture, consisting of forest, rivers, lakes, and rock, including the rock of the Precambrian Shield. The summer climate in the northeast is also cooler and wetter. Canadian prairies focus mainly on agriculture, without much mention of the recreational side. But recreation is a big part of life on the prairies. Cottage life, camping, boating, hunting and fishing, exploring and enjoying the beauty of the plains, lakes and rivers and forests, as well as all the winter sports such as skiing and snowshoeing. Many Canadians have cottages that have been in their families for generations. The cottages often began life as simple cabins, but many have been winterized and can be enjoyed in all four seasons. Freighter canoe. We wanted a canoe, but we didn't have much money to buy one. Then we heard that the Saskatchewan Department of Northern Resources, based in Prince Albert, was holding a disposal sale. The inventory included a freighter canoe that no longer met their standards. We bid on it and got it for $118. It was a wood and canvas Y-stern freighter canoe, 17.5 feet long, 44 inches at the beam and rising to 36 inches at the bow with lots of freeboard and a pronounced keel. It had a couple of cracked ribs and the canvas had pulled away from under the gunnels, the wooden strips along the sides of the canoe at the top, here and there, but it didn't leak. It wasn't good enough for the Department of Northern Resources, but it was good enough for us. It is an understatement to say that this was a stable canoe. In fact, you could stand on a gunnel without tipping it. You could dive in for a swim in the middle of the lake climb back in over the gunnel amidships, and the only water in the canoe would be what you brought in with you. In fact, we couldn't tip it over no matter how hard we tried. One windy day at Okanagan Lake in British Columbia, we removed everything from the canoe and took it out into waist-deep, wavy water. The plan was to tip it over so we could see how difficult it would be to get it upright again if we ever upset it. We never got the chance because we couldn't tip it over. We would get on one side and try to turn it over, but between the wind, the waves, 
and the canoe insisting on staying upright, we kept getting knocked about while the canoe bobbed up and down as stable as could be. It didn't even ship water. This was a seriously stable canoe. It only had a seat in the bow and a seat in the stern. The rest of the space was for freight. I installed seats with flotation below at two points amidships such that each seat could accommodate two paddlers sitting side by side. That provided seating for all six of us, typically with the kids side by side in the middle seats, Carol in the bow and me in the stern. There was still lots of room for any gear we wished to take with us. Canoe all over western Canada. It weighed at least 95 pounds, so it was a brute to lift up and down off the roof racks of the car. I had to turn it over, lift the bow onto the rear roof rack, and then go to the stern and slide the monster up from behind. Its weight bent the commercial roof rack we had, so I had to reinforce the cross pieces with galvanized steel pipe to prevent further bending. We were willing to put up with the challenge of hauling that canoe in and out of the water and up and down off the car roof because it was such a dream to use in the water. It was a lake canoe and could handle waves really well. Its deep keel would easily maintain direction against a quartering wind. There were times when we were out on a lake and the wind rose. Saskatchewan is, of course, famous for wind. And we would come around a point of land and have to make it home in the face of 30-inch waves. No problem. Sometimes we got a bit of spray on us, but we never shipped water. On the other hand, if we tried to paddle down a winding creek, it was another story. The deep keel made the canoe want to track in a straight line. So in order to get it to track around a bend in the stream, I'd yell for half my gang to paddle hard backward on one side, while the other half paddled hard forward on the other side, while Carol and I sweep stroke like maniacs in the bow and stern. That way, if we were lucky, we would be able to follow the winding stream and avoid running aground every five minutes. Eventually, we got a small two-horsepower motor for it. It moved us along at a very moderate pace. A ten-horse would have been better, but the two-horse was some help. If we really wanted to make time, we would run the motor flat out and help it along by all paddling at the same time. We got some strange looks from people with more conventional outfits. There we would be, six people paddling along with a small outboard motor running at maximum speed, and we still weren't breaking any speed records. We had wonderful times with that canoe. After my experience with our freighter canoe, ordinary canoes have always seemed very unstable, positively dinky, and not nearly as much fun. Canoeing the Water Hen We once took an overnight canoe trip on the Water Hen River in northwest Saskatchewan. The weather was warm and glorious. The river flowed fairly fast but without white water, and the river bottom was sandy. The year was about 1973, so the kids ranged in age from 7 to 13, the perfect age for this kind of trip. We had experienced some wonderful but very uncomfortable trips. The kids would have had good reason to complain or refuse to go, but they never did. They were game for anything. We arranged for a guy to accompany us to our upstream launch point and then drive our car to our downstream end point and leave the car for us. We set off and had a glorious, easy day going with the flow, stopping from time to time on a sandbar to wade and swim in the fresh warm water. The current was so fast that we couldn't swim upstream. We could barely hold our own, but it was fun to wade upstream against the current and then swim downstream to the family group on the sandbar, all the while in glorious sunny weather. Farther along, we stopped for lunch on yet another sandbar, dipping into the cooler for the food we had brought. After more travel, we chose a nice bit of shoreline for our overnight stopover lit the camp stove and had a campfire as well, and prepared for our overnight. That's when the deficiencies of our equipment showed up. We didn't even have any mosquito netting. Our plan was to sleep under a tarp draped over our upturned canoe. This would afford us protection against rain, but it was hardly mosquito-proof. There was another aspect to the experience that made things less than comfortable for the kids. To limit our gear, we brought three sleeping bags rather than six, assuming that the four kids wouldn't mind sharing two sleeping bags. No one got much sleep that night. The mosquitoes were fierce and the kids were straight-jacketed in the two sleeping bags. There was a bit of complaining here and there, 
but generally we were just a bunch of Canadians out in the bush putting up with bush conditions. Covered with mosquito bites and sleep deprived, we had a good breakfast, set off again for another lovely paddle downstream and reached our car by mid-afternoon. Looking back, I can't believe how our kids didn't complain about having to put up with the discomforts we subjected them to. They were amazing. Remind me to tell them that. Postscript. In fairness, I should note that they have recalled that mosquito plague night recently. In fact, they even did a skit about it during Carol's and my 60th wedding anniversary celebrations in 2018. Little Lake with No Name One of the places where we enjoyed going with our newly acquired freighter canoe was Meadow Lake Provincial Park in northwest Saskatchewan. On one of these trips, someone whispered to us about a little lake outside the park teeming with fish. When I say whispered, I mean whispered, as in the conspiratorial kind of whisper one uses when one doesn't want a treasure to become widely known. Fisher people will understand the need to keep something like this secret. The story was that the province had recently graded a dirt road on top of a long abandoned rail line, giving road access for the first time to a little nameless lake along the old right-of-way. We decided to see for ourselves if the fish story was true. We followed the directions, found the lake, and launched the canoe. All six of us got aboard and paddled out into the shallow lake. The kids were pretty young. I gave fishing rod to the three who wanted to fish. It was Elaine's first time, and Kevin and David had fished only once or twice before. I told them to start casting. That's when all hell broke loose. They caught a pickerel or pike with every cast. Soon I found myself crashing up and down the canoe, trying to net each fish as it was caught, free it from the net, and remove the hook to allow the kid to cast again. At one point I got a hook in my finger. This was no time for subtlety, so I just tore the hook out, causing considerable pain and bleeding, and carried on with complete abandon. Within minutes, the bottom of the canoe was covered with flopping fish, fish blood, my blood, and total confusion. Carol and Jill, who had elected not to fish, were screaming. The fishing kids were yelling excitedly, and I was going mad. At some point, when I figured we had reached our limit, I called a halt, yelled a halt, I should say, and we stopped to catch our breath. What an experience for first-time fisher kids. What an experience for any fisher person. After that, Elaine was already ready to go again. It didn't matter what time I had to get everyone up for the drive, 5 a.m., 6 a.m., she got up without any fuss and away we'd go. We went to that little lake a couple of times each summer for several years after that and never failed to bring back pickerel and pike for the freezer, a treasured memory. It means a lot to me that Elaine, our youngest kid, and our child who came to us through adoption, was always eager to come fishing with the boys and me. I hope that means she felt secure, felt part of the family, and could trust that she would be treated the same as our other kids. Trust is a huge part of what it takes to make adoption work. I hope those fishing trips on the little nameless lake all those years ago played a part in building that trust. While writing this piece, I asked Elaine if she remembered those fishing trips. She said yes, and she also remembers that she made a cast and got the hook caught in my head. I had forgotten this, but must remember to congratulate her on catching the biggest fish of all. Reading Rock One of the drawers in our kitchen table contains what I call my reading rock. It is two stones glued together and painted over with shellac. It's sort of a silly thing, just two rather ordinary stones held together with glue, but I use it almost every day to hold a book or newspaper in place so that I can read as I have breakfast. I love to read. In fact, you might almost say it's a compulsion. Our daughter Elaine assembled the reading rock as a school project when she was in grade three or four and gave it to me. She got the rocks when she was a student in the Saskatoon Open School while they were out bird watching early one morning. I told her that I still have the reading rock, that I use it almost every day. Whenever I use it, I think of her. What I do best. Our seventh grandchild was born in 2003 during the SARS, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Crisis in Ontario, when hospitals placed strict limits on the number of visitors allowed. 
Expectant grandfathers were not high on the priority list of allowed visitors, placing just ahead of the family goldfish. My job was to stay home and go to bed. This is the sort of job that I am, and this is no time for false modesty, very good at. I immediately set about applying myself conscientiously to the task at hand, and therefore was sound asleep when Carol called at 2.40 in the morning to announce that we had a new grandson. I achieved a sufficiently rapid transition from deep sleep to grandfatherly excitement and made several semi-intelligible sounds while Carol told me the exact time of birth, the condition of the various participants, the weight of the various participants, including, as I recall, the doctor, and the name of the new arrival. My assignment, once a more civilized hour had arrived, was to phone the good news to various other members of the family. I said I would do so, checked on the name again, and went back to sleep. In light of what happened next, it is important to say that the name was unusual, in fact unique. It is also worth repeating in my own defense that I got the information during a brief period of wakefulness in the small hours of the morning. I should also explain that the new grandson's father had put together the words THE LAND to form the wonderful name Theland. I can appreciate the fine name now, but I rather missed the point at the time. I was also informed that the second name was Gardner. Before confusion sets in completely, the reader should please note that the boy's correct name is Theland Gardner Kiknoswe. In the event, Kiknoswe was the only part I got right. I began calling about 7.30, telling everyone in the news that the new lad's name was Feland Gordon Kiknoswe. Kevin's wife, Carol, in Kingston, sounded somewhat dubious and asked, Feland, how do you spell that? And I said, F-E-L-A-N-D, of course, everybody knows that, and carried on with my other calls. Carol, my Carol, not Kevin's, called a bit later, and I, having lost a certain amount of confidence as a result of being questioned about the name by everyone I called, asked about it again. I was told in no uncertain terms that it was not Thelan, but Theland, and I should immediately call everyone with the correct name. So I sent out an email in which I told everyone that the name was not Thelan, but Leland, as in Leland Gordon Kiknoswe. Our family eventually learned Thelan's correct name, no thanks to me. I was then given another assignment, which was to stay out of it. It should be noted that this is another kind of assignment that I can do well. It's important to know what one is good at and what one is not good at. It's part of the maturing process. Postscript. The day after Thelan's birth, I had a conversation with his mother, Elaine. I congratulated her on the arrival of Leland Gordon, and she said, who the hell is that? Or words to that effect, which somewhat reduced the impact of my congratulations and best wishes. Hair. No, not the musical. It's my head we're talking about. The gene for male pattern baldness isn't particularly active among the men of our family, past and present, which means, in contrast to some, that we can't comb our hair with a washcloth. Instead, we have to deal with getting haircuts. My hair was straight and quite hard to manage all through my teens and twenties, just when you don't want it to be difficult to manage. Then came the 1960s, when men stopped cutting their hair and just let it grow. This was the time I chose to begin my brush cut period. No point in doing what everyone else was doing. I let a barber do my brush cut for a few years. Then it dawned on me that I could use our home barber set. I had been cutting our boy's hair anyway. The clippers came with various guides, and one of them was just right for doing a brush cut. That system worked well, except one time in Africa, when the guide fell off, and one swath went right down to the scalp. I wore a hat for several weeks until that disaster corrected itself with the passage of time. The next phase, upon returning from Africa, involved consulting with Carol's hairdresser. Thus begun my long and curly phase, involving getting a permanent about every four months. There was some frustration with this because my hair looked good for only about three weeks out of the four months. It was too tight for the first three weeks and too loose for the last six. However, it usually takes a decade or two for me to smarten up and realize there might be a better way. So eventually I had a consultation with another hairdresser, whom I'll call D, the one Carol was then going to. I arrived complete with curls and explained my dissatisfaction. She proposed an alternative that sounded good to me, so we agreed that I would return once the perm had grown itself out. Carol arrived for a hairdo later that same day and asked Dee what she and Ken had decided. Without batting an eye, she said, that's confidential between me and my client. So Carol had to wait to get home and ask me 
what the hairdresser and I had decided. Without having conferred with Dee about this, I said, that's confidential between me and my hairdresser. Carol had to live with her frustration. A few weeks later, I went to my first styling by the hairdresser. The perm was nowhere in sight. My hair was close to my head, helmet style, and Carol wasn't in when I returned home. And when she came in, she was preoccupied and didn't look at me right away. I didn't say anything. When she did look at me, she said, holy shit. So the next time I went for a haircut, I asked Dee whether her hairstyles were generally known as holy shit hairstyles. She acknowledged that Carol's was one of the more emphatic reactions, but in general, she liked the idea that the haircut had an impact. Humphrey. One day I arrived at Moda, the hair salon where Dee worked at the time, to find the place in a tizzy. A client had noticed a small dog, lost, cold, and frightened, wandering the busy Ottawa streets. She had brought it to the shop so the number on its tag could be ascertained and the owner called. In the meantime, the dog was fussed over, petted, and cuddled by several of the dog-loving women working there. And one of them phoned the number on the tag and left a message saying where the dog was. At a certain point, referring to the three women in the shop who were fussing over the dog, I said to Dee, Too bad you don't treat your customers as well as you treat a stray dog. She said, Wait a minute, and disappeared into the back where the dog was being so well looked after. She came back and reported, They say, Fine, which ear does your client want to be scratched behind? The dog's name was Humphrey and he was a great little dog. He didn't bark at all till his owner showed up and said his name, to which Humphrey replied, Woof! When the owner said, Time to go, Humphrey, the little dog went from person to person in the shop, wagging his tail to say goodbye. The owner was an artist and was so impressed at how well his dog had been treated that he donated a painting to the shop. Mud Pack we were driving along a country road on a hot Manitoba summer day, windows all open, wind rushing in, Carol in the back seat with a couple of kids, and another kid beside me in the front seat. This was before air conditioning, seat belts, airbags, and before we knew kids shouldn't be riding in the front seat. Carol was wearing a nice pair of shorts and was sitting with one leg crossed over the other when a bee slammed into the doorpost and landed stunned just under her raised thigh. When Carol uncrossed her legs, she was immediately stung on the upper leg by the stunned bee. She yelped in pain and demanded in no uncertain terms that I do something about it. I spotted a slough nearby in a farmer's field and pulled off the road and signaled Carol to come with me. I took her to the edge of the slough and told her to face the other way and bend over. Then I picked up a handful of sloppy mud and slapped it over the sting area. Carol demanded to know what I was doing. She thought I was simply using the opportunity to slap her on the bottom with a handful of wet mud. She was highly suspicious. Her skepticism, however, quickly turned to amazement. The pain immediately began to subside as the cool, wet mud started to dry, acting, in fact, as a poultice, drawing out venom, stinger, and inflammation simultaneously. My credibility as a practitioner of folk medicine was at least temporarily seen in a more favorable light. Possession is nine-tenths. In about 1968, when we were living on Quance Avenue in Saskatoon, Mary Tollefson, our neighbor from up the street, noticed that we were using a chrome kitchen table and chairs in our dining room. She mentioned that she had her mother's old dining room suite, but she only had room for the sideboard in her house. The other pieces were stored in an unheated garage. She said it looked as if we would have room for the set in our dining room. We agreed, so I hooked up our trailer and went and got the table, hutch, and six chairs from Mary's garage. They fitted nicely in the dining room and thus began a long coexistence with the Tollefson dining room suite. It was an oak set, ordered in 1932 from Eaton's catalog as a wedding present for Mary's parents' wedding. The set had suffered somewhat from being stored in a garage over several Saskatoon winters, the varnish finish had cracked and some of the glue joints had loosened, but otherwise it was basically in fine shape. We liked the set so much that after a few years we offered to buy it, but it belonged to Mary's mother and she didn't want to sell. She told us to just keep using it. 
In 1980, after our Africa sojourn, when we were planning our move from Saskatoon to Ottawa, we again raised the question of the dining room suite. Should we buy it? Did they or any of their kids want it back? This was the time to decide because we didn't want to pay for moving it if they were going to want it back soon. They said that neither they nor their kids had room for it, but didn't want to sell it, so why not just take it to Ottawa? Okay, we said, and did. A few years later, Mary and Ed Tollefson moved to Ottawa, and we visited back and forth, they admiring the eight pieces of their dining room suite in the old Ottawa house, we admiring the one piece in theirs. Years later, after Mary died and Ed was moving to Victoria, he passed along the sideboard, so all nine pieces of the suite were reunited again under one roof. We again offered to buy the suite, but Ed said one of his kids might want it someday, so he should just keep using it in the meantime. Then we got word that their son Mark in Toronto wanted the suite. We prepared ourselves emotionally to end our long, happy relationship. However, when we called him about shipping it to him, it transpired that he didn't have room for it and was just going to have to store it in Toronto. We said, that's going to cost you a lot of money. Would you like us to just keep storing it for you in Ottawa? He said that would be fine, and that's what has happened. That was more than 20 years ago, as of this writing. We'd now been storing all or part of the dining room suite for more than 40 years. The Tollefsons really should have sent us a bill for rent. But then we'd have sent them a bill for storage, making sure the storage bill equaled the rental bill. Both invoices would become historical family documents, depicting the lore associated with what is now an antique dining room suite. Postscript. At one point, Mark's sister Claire visited us in Ottawa, where we sat around the dining room suite and talked about its long history with us. We said we had tried to buy it on several occasions, and that we intended to send Ed a bill for storage equal to the sale price. Claire thought I could also reasonably charge for the repair work I had done on the suite, in which case her father might actually owe us money on the transaction. She seemed to find this very amusing. Postscript. A few years later, Carol and I were updating our wills, and I wanted to ensure that the dining room suite would not become part of either of our estates. I wrote to Ed saying I was drafting a letter to be stored with our wills to the effect that the suite was owned by the Tullison family. I asked Ed what address I should put in the letter. We were surprised and pleased to get a letter back gifting the dining room suite to us. We now owned it, a wonderful outcome. <clears throat> Mind you, I suspect that Claire might have had some involvement in this, and that Ed was simply trying to avoid getting a bill for storage and repairs. Oak Table Carol and I used to write Christmas family newsletters. They were pleasant, informative, and polite. Not as boring as some, but not gripping, edge-of-your-seat prose either. Then one year, the old oak table took over the job and began writing our Christmas newsletters. The table then proceeded to write several more Christmas letters. It was much less polite as it reported quite frankly on the sometimes dubious goings-on of the Shipley family sitting around it. In fact, the table said things about family members that I would never dream of saying myself, and I made a point of dissociating myself from the sometimes outrageous comments, not to mention bad puns, that were written by the table in those newsletters. Here are a couple of examples. From our 1993 newsletter, after referring to the gusto with which some of those gathered around it dug into the spread of food, Oak Table wrote, Speaking of lightening my load, I just realized that Richard isn't here. I always admire his leadership in that department. I've never been to California, but they must be short of food there. His wife Lois, Carol's sister, isn't nearly as dedicated at the table. Shame. On the other hand, I notice that those two work their buns off whenever they're here. First in line to do the dishes, carry wood for the fireplace, vacuum, etc. Actually, the standard of housekeeping, if you can dignify what happens around here with that phrase, picks up quite a bit when they're here. From the 1996 newsletter, in a comment to the recipients, as an aside, if I could have a quiet word with some of my fellow antiques out there, it looks as if some of you have been skimping on the lemon oil. There's nothing like it to bring your finish up to scratch, so to speak. I shouldn't have to say this, but lemon oil is intended to be used externally. And I see what's going on around here, and it's no oak. Sorry, I promised I wouldn't do that. 
It's rather disconcerting to sit around a dining room table that's making notes on everything you say for possible use in an incriminating newsletter. Plumbing bread. It's very inconvenient when your teenage daughter eats your plumbing bread. There's an old plumber's trick that helps when soldering a new connection into an existing copper water line, especially a line that runs horizontally. The problem is that the temperature at which water boils is lower than the temperature at which solder melts. Thus, any water remaining in the line will boil and change to steam before the solder melts, making it impossible to solder the joint properly. You need to find a way to keep the water away from the joint long enough to solder it. Nothing works better than plain white bread. In fact, plain white bread is not suitable for much else. The trick is to roll up two little balls of white bread and push them into the line on each side of the joint you wish to solder. The bread balls act as a temporary dam that prevents the water from flowing toward the joint. The soldering can then proceed as usual. Once the water is turned back on, the bread dams dissolve and disappear. Note, you must use the kind of plain white boring bread that comes wrapped in plastic. In fact, my suggestion to the big bakeries is to change the name of such bread to plumbing bread. It's not fit for human consumption anyway. Bread factories, are you listening? An aside, don't try this with brown bread. I made that mistake and for two weeks we had bits of bran coming out of taps all over the house. Buy the most revolting white bread you can find. Anyway, I was working away on replumbing our house making use of plumbing bread from time to time. Sometimes I would have to set the work aside to do other things, at which time I would put the bread bag in the freezer with a sign on it saying, plumbing bread, do not eat. One day I was preparing to resume the plumbing job. I went to get my package of plumbing bread from the freezer, but it wasn't there. I went storming around the house, yelling about my missing plumbing bread. Eventually the resident teenage daughter came to life long enough to say, oh that, I ate it. I said, that bread has been banging around in and out of my toolbox for a month. Didn't you see the sign? Apparently not, or perhaps she ate that too. A few weeks later, our house was struck with a case of parent-teenage daughter alienation. She moved out and stayed with a friend. We had little contact with her for several months. However, we did have her address and forwarded her mail to her from time to time. At some point, I was doing more plumbing work and had renewed my supply of plumbing bread and I thought, what the heck, and mailed a couple of slices to the kid with a note saying, I thought you might be missing your regular diet of plumbing bread. Hope you're doing okay. Her housemate said, your dad mailed you what? She dropped by to say hello the next day, acting as if there'd never been a problem between us. Advice to parents of alienated teenage daughters, if they leave home and are out of touch, mail them a couple of slices of plumbing bread. Works every time. Water dump. When our four kids were young adults, we often had an assortment of young people hanging around the house. Some of them related to us, some of them not. There were goings on, some of which we parents knew about, and some of which we didn't. One summer day, I was walking along to the house, just as one of the aforementioned goings on was going on. Two Kevins were involved, one of them ours, one of them not ours, one on the ground, one above on the third floor deck. The lower Kevin, Pelly, not Shipley, was apparently searching for something in the flower bed right below the third floor deck. Daughter Elaine had arrived only seconds before me and was responding to a plea from the lower Kevin to help him find his keys, which he had dropped among the flowers. Elaine, always willing to help, stepped forward to assist with the search. Things happened quickly after that, with the lower Kevin stepping back quickly, and the upper Kevin, Shipley, not Pelly, who had been hiding on the third floor balcony, quickly moving forward to dump a full pail of water down on Elaine's head. I didn't actually see the impact of water on head, but I did see the immediate aftermath. Hair streaming straight down, head and t-shirt, totally soaked, and Elaine shaking with laughter, knowing she'd been had. Totally slapstick, totally funny. Elk slobber. Our three grandsons, Michael, Ben, and Jonathan, between the ages of eight and ten at the time, about 2005, sat in the back seat of our car. 
we were heading for the Omega Wildlife Park in western Quebec, featuring large animals of the Canadian wilds. The various animals of the bovine persuasion, elk, deer, moose, bison, etc., were quite used to tourists coming along and feeding them carrots from the car. We purchased a large bag of carrots and were advised that if we made the mistake of having our window fully open, one of these big animals would stick its head right into the car and happily keep eating carrots until our supply ran out. Pushing a big carrot-seeking bovine head back out of a car window would not be a trivial task. The trick was to lower the window only enough to stick the carrots out so that the animals could grab them from outside. Whether the animal's head was inside or outside, there was the matter of slobber. It turns out that these critters slobber a lot, especially when grabbing carrots with their tongues. If you are unfortunate enough to find yourself with an elk head in your car, you will be covered with copious quantities of slobber. Even if you have the window down only a carrot width, there will be liberal amounts of slobber on the window, both inside and out. Omega is a great place for an outing, a very nice outing, especially if you are keen on slobber. As we drove to the park, I introduced the topic of slobber by observing that our grandsons were very nice looking boys, but they would look even better covered with a thick coating of elk slobber. Ben said, Grandpa, you're crazy. A very satisfactory response. I'm sure this is the way all grandfathers want to be thought of by their grandchildren, a someone who goes on and on about elk slobber. It was good for them to get a true reading on me at such an early age. As it happened, the boys kept their windows rolled down only about three inches, just enough to allow the passage of carrots out and bovine tongues in, not to mention copious quantities of slobber running down both inside and outside the glass. My warnings about slobber during the drive kept our grandsons relatively, but by no means completely, free of slobber, elk or otherwise. Mind you, we could hardly see through the coating of slobber on the rear windows as we drove home. Alarm and caller time. Canada's changeover to the metric system has been sporadic. Complete in some sectors, mixed in others, and non-existent in still others. Toothpaste was the first consumable to change in 1974. Then, on 1 April 1975, Fahrenheit temperatures were replaced by Celsius. That was the first step in changing our weather to metric. Next, in September 1975, rain started to fall in millimeters and snow in centimeters. Then, on 1 April 1976, wind speed, visibility, and atmospheric pressure went metric, with atmospheric pressure reported in kilopascals. The USA has resisted converting to metric and has, as much as possible, continued with the imperial system. Canada must be one of the most schizophrenic countries in the world, caught as we are between the way the U.S. does things and the way of the rest of the world. The U.S. is by far Canada's largest trading partner, so we have little choice but to use measurements that are understandable to Americans. On the other hand, the USA has extensive trading and other commercial relationships with the rest of the world, so it's forced, much of the time, to use metric measurements internationally. Sometimes Canada's metric stroke imperial schizophrenia can be seen in the same product. For example, thickness in sheets of plywood is shown in metric, while the other dimensions are in imperial. A sheet of plywood used to be shown, for example, as four feet wide by eight feet long by three quarter inch thick but it's now shown as four feet wide by eight feet long by 17 millimeters thick. How ridiculous can we get? Still, Canadians are relatively fluent in both systems of measurement, and everybody's smartphone enables us quickly to calculate conversions from one system to the other. The change I had most fun with was the change to Celsius on April 1, 1975. My wife, Carol, was having her hair done that morning, at a salon where the radio station CFQC was broadcasting the Wall and Den show. They were talking about the change to metric temperature and added that a much less publicized change had taken place that morning, and that was the change to metric time, known as Larman Caller time. In the new system, there would be 10 hours in a day, 100 minutes in each hour, etc. The station was offering, as a public service, a special sticker that could be pasted onto your watch face to convert your watch to alarm and caller time. 
Carol found this news very distressing. She said, Drat, I just bought a new watch. Why didn't Ken tell me? He keeps track of these things. Wallenden had thus sucked in at least one Saskatoon resident with their April Fool's joke. Carol was properly chagrined when she found out. My cousin Leo. My cousin Leo, that would be Leo Heise, my second cousin, used to be a beekeeper, a small operator with a few hives on an organic farm in the Pontiac region of Quebec. She did a fine job of looking after the bees and supporting them in producing wonderful honey. The weakest part of her operation, which she freely admits, was the marketing side. When the time came to take the honey from the hives and extract it, Leo's daughter Nona, that would be Nona, my second cousin once removed, often came to help. It would get hot in the extracting shed and it got messy cleaning out the extractor after each batch. In particular, the front of one's shirt gets extremely sticky. The solution, remove shirts to allow mother and daughter to work topless. Easier to wash honey off self than off clothes. One evening while dining with friends, I was describing my cousin's honey operation and the question of how best to help her with marketing. At one point, I found myself using the phrase, sweetest breasts in the Pontiac. I thought it had a certain ring to it, not to mention considerable marketing potential. But when I told Leo what I'd come up with, she said, that's the last time I'm going to tell you anything. I thought this indicated a certain lack of generosity on her part. You'd think she'd be pleased to have help with the marketing side of her operation, while at the same time being a source of entertainment for a whole community. Cousin once removed. Earlier, I referred to Leo as my second cousin and Nona as my second cousin once removed. Whenever I talk about cousins, whether second or third, removed or not removed, I get a throw hands in the air, I've never understood that stuff reaction from everyone within earshot. It's very simple, really. The first, second, third, etc. type of cousin is of the same generation as you. The once, twice, thrice removed type is one, two, or three generations away from your generation. Thus, if Nona, my second cousin once removed, had a child, the child would be my second cousin twice removed. Whereas if Nona has a cousin of her generation to whom I am not otherwise related, that person would be my third cousin once removed. See, I told you it was simple. Another way of explaining it, which is bound to simplify it even more, is to consider the matter of grandparents. If person A and person B are not siblings, but have a set of grandparents in common, they are first cousins. However, if person A has grandparents who are the parents of B's grandparents, A and B are first cousins once removed. Now, aren't you glad you stayed around for the second and even simpler explanation? The disconcerting thing about all this for us long in the tooth types is that there are times when the younger generation would like some of us to be removed even further, nomenclature notwithstanding. Victory for National Rodent Cousin L, who on more formal occasions is known as Cousin Leo, is having a confrontation with a family of beavers. So far, the beavers are winning. Cousin L's farm has a long lane leading from the municipal road to the house. The lane is often problematic, particularly where it passes through a low, wet area. In winter, this spot is often difficult or impassable because of snowdrifts. It's usually better once spring comes, except that it can be muddy. But one spring, there were difficulties. The beavers decided that the world would be a better place if this low, wet area could be transformed into a low, wet pond, with the built-up road serving very nicely as a dam, thus saving a lot of beaver labor. The only impediment to this plan was the pesky culvert under the road that allows water to flow through, thus keeping the pond from overflowing the road. Beaver solution, plug culvert. Task defined, the beavers set to work, and in one night succeeded in plugging the culvert. This resulted in the water, of which there is quite a flow during the spring snow melt, rising quickly and flowing over the road. This meant that driving through the low spot over the narrow road with the water flowing around your wheels became even more difficult. Plus there was a risk that the flowing water would wash the road away. 
It was now Cousin L's turn to define a task. Get rid of the beavers. She hired a marksman who, for a fee, began shooting at the beavers. I don't know whether the marksman was absent on the day when the topic of refraction of light was dealt with in school, but if he was present, he obviously didn't get beyond the theoretical. He would aim at the beaver under the water and miss it by a foot or more. The problem was he was aiming at where the beaver appeared to be, whereas because of the way light bends when traveling from under the water to the air above, the beaver was actually a foot or more away from where the shooter was aiming. Cousin Al eventually fired the marksman, who left willingly, being thoroughly sick of having the beaver's thumb and noses at him each time he shot and missed. Actually, the marksman did kill one beaver, which led to a rather grisly outcome, where the other beaver simply used the carcass of the dead beaver to help plug the culvert. Things were not looking up. Score, beaver one, Cousin L zero. Cousin L then set a trap for the beaver. Using her all-purpose live trap, a cage-like contraption meant mainly for trapping raccoons, transporting and releasing them over the fences of neighbors you don't like. The beavers, preparing for their nightly work, examined the trap with interest. They immediately saw a potential use for the trap and were pleased and surprised at receiving assistance from such an unexpected source. They placed the trap in front of the culvert as a convenient starting point for weaving the various branches, stems, and twigs into place as a culvert plug. Using the trap in this way accomplished two things. It made plugging the culvert much quicker and it drove Cousin L to distraction. Score, Beavers 2, Cousin L 0. Cousin L eventually got the beavers to relocate. I'm not sure how, but I prefer to end this story with the beavers winning the contest. Postscript. In the early days of the Dominion, our European ancestors set about choosing the national symbol for Canada. They saw the beaver, always industrious, cutting down trees, building beaver dams and beaver houses as the ideal choice. The beaver was the very image of the kind of hard work that would be needed to build our young country. The Indians thought these Johnny-come-lately European settlers were out of their minds. The Indians regarded the beaver as the most destructive animal in the forest, a really stupid choice for the national symbol. On the other hand, the Europeans were destroying everything they touched, so maybe the beaver was an appropriate choice after all. Post postscript. The beaver is a member of the rodent class. This is one reason I love being Canadian. What other country would have the humility, if that's the right word, to choose a rodent as its national animal? Tender New Year's Message Carol and I were settling in for a very pleasant New Year's Eve at the Kingston home of our son Kevin, his wife Carol, and their four kids. The plan was for the kids to watch a TV movie in the other room while the adults had a glass or two and stayed up to bring in the new year. The movie the kids were to watch was Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Kevin, who can't resist corrupting names, for example, Home Depot equals Homely Despot, Canadian Tire equals Crappy Tire, Red Lobster equals Dead Mobster, routinely called the above movie Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, much to the consternation of his wife Carol, who tries against great odds to maintain some semblance of decorum in their home. Anyway, Carol was in the process of proposing to the kids that they go into the room next door to watch a nice movie. She was talking in a very tender manner, hoping to make their proposal as appealing as possible, thus keeping our New Year's Eve pleasantly serene. She said to the kids something like, How about all going into the family room to watch Shitty Shitty? Kevin! Blaming her badly brought up husband for always messing with names and tripping her up. Bottom line, it worked. The kids immediately rushed into the next room, thinking that they at last were going to be allowed to watch a naughty movie. Birthday message to grandson Ben. Ben, I didn't start out to give what may be the chintziest birthday gift in history, but I think that may be what you are getting here. A booklet called Life in Pacific Tide Pools. First, I paid $1.95 for this booklet when I bought it in 1967. Second, I'm lending you the booklet, not giving it to you. And third, I expect the subject matter is high on the list of topics you are not the slightest bit interested in. Now that I have your attention, 
Let me say a word or two about the contents of the booklet. If you want to see one of your early ancestors, turn to 40 stroke 4, page 40, plate 4, where we find the sea squirt, which belongs to the phylum chordata, animals with spinal cords. Although the sea squirt doesn't have a backbone, it does have spinal nerves, so say hello to a distant cousin. Then there's the peanut worm, 16 stroke 6, which is extremely undiscriminating about what it eats. It sends a sticky mucus out to collect food. The mucus often collects as much sand as food, but the peanut worm can't tell the difference, so eats everything the mucus brings in. Some of your fellow students may have similar dietary habits. Speaking of your fellow students, take a look at the starfish, 17 stroke 16, which gets along quite nicely with no brain. I'll say no more about this. The starfish has another ability in that it sends its stomach out to eat and digest its dinner. It then draws the stomach back in to be sent out again for the next meal. This also makes me think of student life and how convenient it would be to be able to send your stomach out for pizza. Let me know how this works out. Many other strange creatures are described in this booklet. No hurry to thank me, because I know you'll be off somewhere staring intently into a tidal pool well out of Wi-Fi range. Happy 21st birthday, 2017. Willow Pattern Somewhere around 1984, Carol and I were on vacation in Devon, in England, during the strawberries and clotted cream season. Fabulous! It was hard to resist stopping three times a day for tea, strawberries, and clotted cream. We were staying in B&Bs each night, enjoying the nice homes and friendly hosts encountered along the way. We came down to breakfast one morning to find one other couple at the table. As a way of beginning the conversation, we noted that the table was set in the familiar willow pattern and remarked that we had bought a willow pattern plate at a flea market the day before. Carol and the other woman then began waxing on enthusiastically about the romantic willow pattern story, the Chinese princess who fell in love with a servant boy. When her father would not let them marry, they committed suicide by jumping off a bridge, whereupon they changed into doves and flew away to be together forever. It's a very romantic story. The other guy and I hadn't said anything, but I pushed my fried eggs and bacon aside to have a closer look at the plate and said, pretty low bridge. The other guy also pushed his eggs and bacon aside and said yes. I said they must have had to jump off it several times. The other guy then said, until they died of exhaustion, at which point the women wanted to know what the men were talking about. When we told them, the reaction was, men are hopeless, no sense of the romantic at all. Swearing. I have to confess to using stronger language than did my parents or grandparents. In fact, I can probably match your proverbial stevedore as regards bad language. But at least I didn't get it from my grandparents or my father, who swore worse than his father, just as I swear worse than my father did. Nobody else can take credit for this. I've achieved this all on my own, and I attribute it to my overall creative use of the English language. My sister remembers once back on the farm when our paternal grandfather had a bad fall behind the house near the cellar door. He tripped over something and fell full length straight forward. He wasn't a young man even then. He swore, I don't know what we would expect today, but what he said was, God's truth. But that's worse than my maternal grandfather ever uttered. The strongest curse anyone ever heard him say was Shaw. I haven't mentioned our grandmothers here. I don't remember ever hearing them swear at all. Perhaps our grandchildren will once again rise to the standard of their great-grandparents. Maybe the future will be better. It's unlikely to be worse. I don't regard my swearing as an admirable quality that I want to pass along to my grandchildren. But I don't hold out much hope. Our grandchildren are so smart, they'll see through my attempts to persuade them to adopt a higher standard. They're more likely to do as I do than as I say. I'm afraid I'm setting a bad example, but I'm unlikely to do much about it, so there you are. Celebrations. I've always pretended not to be the romantic type, so I try not to make a fuss about birthdays, anniversaries, and such. 
That being the case, how come I have usually proposed something unusual, even exotic, for Carol's birthday, or for our anniversary, or both? I'm pretty good at remembering important occasions, but not nearly as good at figuring out an appropriate way to celebrate. Something quite often goes awry. 25th Wedding Anniversary For our 25th wedding anniversary, I propose that we celebrate with a picnic lunch and a bottle of wine by hiking to one of our favorite spots in the Gatineau Park in Quebec, across the river from Ottawa. This particular spot Featuring the remains of a wonderful old stone mill by a rushing stream was a place we regularly visited in winter when cross-country skiing. It was a beautiful spot then and promised to be equally beautiful in June, the month of our anniversary. When skiing along that trail in the winter, we always noticed a posted sign, no nudity allowed. With three feet of snow and a temperature well below freezing, we concluded that park authorities might expect a high degree of compliance in their directive. But on this beautiful June day, when nudity would be quite comfortable, we noticed that the no nudity sign was nowhere to be seen. We didn't give it much thought as we arrived at the old mill, found a pleasant spot on a stone bridge and sat down to enjoy our lunch. Just as I finished uncorking the wine, a stark naked man came out of the bush on the other side of the stream and posed on a rock in the sun glaring at us. Carol remarked that he was a handsome young man and a nice addition to the scenery as far as she was concerned. We continued with our lunch. Soon, two more naked men emerged from the bush, positioned themselves here and there on rocks around the clearing, and joined the first man in glaring at us. Carol and I have a number of things in common, but on that day we found another one, that it takes more than three nude men perched on rocks glaring at us to drive us away from a good lunch and a nice bottle of wine. We finished the repast at our leisure, gathered up our things, smiled and waved to the three chaps and strolled back down the path. On our way out, we passed another nude man standing among the trees. Carol found it interesting that on our 25th wedding anniversary, she found herself surrounded by five men, all of whom were naked except her husband. That was not quite the way I planned it. Postscript. We found out that in summer, the site of the old mill is a popular hangout for gay men. Once again, I had made a choice for a celebration that wasn't as appropriate as I had hoped. Birthday celebrations. My track record is somewhat better when planning a celebration of Carol's birthday. An example was a trip to Fernhill Club in Jamaica. I had attended a CUSA meeting there and was very impressed by the setting, the service, and the reasonable price. Ferd Hill Club is located near Port Antonio on the north shore of Jamaica, across the island from the capital, Kingston. Jamaica is a lush tropical island, and the Port Antonio side is the lushest part of Jamaica. On returning home from the meeting, I deliberately downplayed how great Fern Hill Club was, but merely said I thought it would be a nice place to go to celebrate Carol's February birthday. She asked some questions, but I just said it was quite nice and tried to avoid talking about it much. We made the necessary booking and flew to Kingston on the appointed day. Fern Hill Club is an all-inclusive resort. Once you've paid your fee, that's it. We were met at the airport by the club's van and driver for the trip over the mountain from Kingston to Port Antonio. As it turned out, the trip added to the contrast. We arrived in Kingston just as darkness was falling and immediately began bumping along the rough Kingston streets, out into the country and over the winding roads through the mountains. The drive, accompanied by the smell of diesel exhaust and lurching along the winding road, was supposed to take two hours. It took nearly three, given the frequent stops our driver made to visit his various girlfriends along the route. By the time we arrived, Carol was exhausted, feeling ill from the diesel fumes and generally not very optimistic about our prospects for an enjoyable vacation. The contrast upon arrival could not have been more impressive. Our accommodation high above the Caribbean Sea consisted of a large sunken living room, balcony with big hot tub overlooking the sea, and a large bedroom with frangipani blossoms and chocolates on the pillows. It was dark, so we couldn't yet see the view or what the grounds of the resort were like. We woke in the morning to a breathtaking view, the beautiful grounds, 
a wonderful breakfast, and a short bus ride to Frenchman's Cove, one of the most fabulously beautiful beaches in the world. Our time at Fern Hill Club continued to be as delightful as it promised on first arrival. The club had delicious food, attentive staff, free transport to the beach, and enjoyable nightly entertainment in which we participated. The Fern Hill Club experience was so good that my reputation for planning celebrations for Carol and me was at least temporarily restored. Postscript. We are again on holiday in Jamaica as I write this. A search on the internet reveals that Fern Hill Club has deteriorated considerably since we stayed there three years ago. It has not been well maintained. Shame. My pre-heathen life. Carol and I were asked to co-lead a church youth group at Grosvenor Park United Church in Saskatoon. We were to work with the Christian Education Director. The year was 1967, so our own kids ranged in age from four to eight years. We had no previous experience working with teenagers, so we conferred regularly and at length with the CE Director about how to work with the teens and what the program should be. We also consulted the teens themselves about what kind of program they wanted. It was a rewarding experience. There were regular Sunday evening meetings, day trips, parties, dances, and camping trips. We showed films, brought in speakers, had discussions on various topics, and played games. We loved the kids and we know they loved us. A few became lifelong friends. We had recently moved to Saskatchewan, which had elected the first democratic socialist government in North America in 1944, under the leadership of Tommy Douglas. Our move to Saskatchewan was in 1964. The Liberals had just been elected after 20 years of democratic socialist government. Feelings were still raw from the bitter 1962 doctor's strike following the introduction of Medicare on 1 July of that year, North America's first universal public health care system. I mention these continuing tensions because we unknowingly stumbled into the middle of them as we developed the program for our youth group. Our own political maturity grew in the environment that prevailed in Saskatchewan in those days. Tommy Douglas stepped down soon after the introduction of Medicare to become national leader of the federal New Democratic Party formed in 1961. Douglas died in 1986, but in a 2004 poll by the CBC, Douglas was voted the greatest Canadian of all time. Our approach to leading the teen group was progressive in the sense that we did not dictate to the kids what the program would be, but sought their views and tried to build a suitable program in response. We were supported in this approach by the CE director and developed what might be considered for the time some quite radical programming. For example, in one late evening discussion during a camping trip, the teens trusted Carol and me sufficiently to ask some questions about sex and the different ways that girls and boys view the world. As a result, we put together a six-week sex education program with a Christian basis. It may not come as a big surprise that participation during those sex education sessions more than doubled from our usual 15 to about 40, as more and more kids heard about what was happening. It may also not come as a big surprise that when the parents heard about what was happening, some of them were not pleased. After all, we weren't sticking strictly to Bible study, which no doubt some of them would have preferred. In fact, the reaction got so hot at one point that Carol and I were called to appear before session, in effect the board of directors of the church. The setup of the meeting was intimidating, whether this was intentional or not. Carol and I were invited to sit on two chairs in the middle of the room with no table in front of us, while the members of session sat behind a line of tables across the room from us. They asked questions about our leadership of the group. Some of the questions suggested that some of the parents were not in favor of sex, let alone sex education. We answered straightforwardly, referring to our needs identification approach with the group, leading to educational program design. Carol certainly felt intimidated. I didn't. I figured if we got fired, I had other things I could do with my Sunday evenings. It was Harold Chapman, who at that time was principal of the Saskatoon-based Cooperative College of Canada, who stopped the grilling by saying he thought the church was very fortunate to have this fine young couple providing leadership for the group. In the end, we were thanked for coming and allowed to carry on, 
which we did for two more years. In the meantime, I continued with church involvement as I had for more than 20 years, singing in the choir, serving on the Committee of Stewards, which manages the temporal affairs of the church, and attending Sunday services. My 10 years of singing lessons back in Winnipeg, combined with a good voice as proclaimed by various adjudicators in festival competitions, meant that there was no shortage of singing engagements in church and elsewhere. In short, I was very involved in church life and singing around the community. A new reverend had been hired as minister of the church. He was conservative. His aim was to avoid any controversy in this, his final parish before retirement. He and the CE director didn't see eye to eye, and a few months later she was fired. Carol and I were very angry. We thought it should have been the minister who was sent packing, not the CE director. But the minister had more power and status than the CE director, so she was the one who had to go. C and I took different paths in our reactions to the event. See below. Letter of Resignation I was so outraged at the firing of the CE director that I wrote a letter to Session resigning from the church. Such letters are not common. Most people who leave the church just stop attending and don't ever darken the door, except perhaps at Christmas and Easter. I wrote a letter stating my reasons for resigning. Session didn't quite know what to do with the letter, and I again was asked to appear before them to explain myself. I did so, essentially reiterating what I had said in the letter, that I thought the CE director had been doing a good job and her firing was grossly unfair, and that I didn't want to be associated with any church that would do such a thing. I stopped attending church altogether. Carol followed a different path in that she transferred from Grosvenor Park United to Knox United in downtown Saskatoon, taking our kids with her. I made a radical change in my Sunday morning routine by starting to bake bread. It took me a while to learn how to knead bread dough properly, but soon I was producing six loaves of very good brown bread and two trays of delicious brown cinnamon buns every Sunday morning. I would start at about 5.30 so everything would be out of the oven by the time the family came home from church. Any static that might otherwise have come my way about not attending church tended to be muted by the aroma of freshly baked bread when the hungry group came through the door. Baking bread became quite routine after a while, leaving time to think of other things. The doubts about my religious beliefs that had been in the back of my mind for years pushed forward into my consciousness, leading to a big change in the way I approach and live my life. More on this below. The Happy Heathen Perhaps I should have called this section the abominable agnostic or some such, because agnostic is closer to my position than heathen, but happy heathen has a better ring to it. According to one dictionary definition, an agnostic is a person who holds the view that any ultimate reality, such as God, is unknown and probably unknowable. One would think that this would be a fairly neutral, unthreatening position to hold. It's not, but more on that later. Heathen is a much more loaded word, often applied to unenlightened or barbaric idolaters and primitive or ancient tribes. The two possible titles of this section offer a choice. Whereas I prefer to consider myself an agnostic, I expect my readers will prefer to consign me to the unenlightened barbaric idolater category. There, now everybody's satisfied. I am a happy heathen, or at least reasonably happy. On the positive side, I feel truer to myself than I did when I was involved in church life while ignoring my doubts. I have to admit, however, that I miss some of the things I have left behind. First and foremost is sacred music. Much of the world's most magnificent music, produced by many of the world's greatest composers, celebrates religious belief, especially Christian belief. I was very involved with sacred music for a long time, singing in choirs, solos, duets, quartets, festival competitions, church, and Christmas concerts. I loved it deeply. It was a huge part of my life, from my late teens until I realized that I was no longer comfortable with being part of the celebration of Christianity. Next are the people with whom I associated in the church. I was good at what I did around church, whether it was leading the teen group with Carol, serving on committees, or helping with the service through my music. I enjoyed it all and the people I associated with. Church people are now rather guarded with me and I with them. 
there is always the elephant in the room. We avoid certain topics. When I'm with a church-centered group and they are talking shop, I can't enter in. For the most part, I find it best to avoid such social situations. Carol's church life is an integral part of who she is. This is something we no longer share as we once did. There is now a gap in what we share together. She understands why I can't pretend to believe something that I don't, and why it would be hypocritical for me to go through the motions, but our views of God are now very different. Then there's the outlook on the world that many church people have. Their religious philosophy urges them to help others in need, and many do so through social activism and financial giving. Many church people make huge contributions to the betterment of our world. I do a lot of this sort of thing too, but from a humanist rather than from a religious motivation. I thus have a lot in common with church-based activists, but our motivations are somewhat different. Doubts about my faith had been in the back of my mind for years, but it was only when I stepped back from day-to-day church involvement that I began to look at the issues more objectively. I did quite a lot of reading in those years in the hope of coming to a belief system with which I felt comfortable. My readings in liberal theology included Bishop John A.T. Robinson's controversial Honest to God, published in 1963. The book had an impact on me because he dismissed concepts of God as being up there in the sky, quote-unquote, or out there in the universe, quote-unquote, in favor of defining God as love, essentially endorsing Paul Tillich's contention that God is the ground of all being. Robinson basically concluded that you can make all the arguments you like, pro and con, about what you believe in and why, but in the end it takes a leap of faith to believe in God. I kept mulling that over in my mind as I prayed, sang, and listened to sermons in church. I realized that I could not make Robinson's leap of faith. One reviewer noted that Robinson's book was essentially a summary of the views of Rudolf Bultmann, Paul Tillich, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer. It did not introduce new or more radical thinking, yet it unleashed a storm of controversy. The book's publication in 1963 placed it in the midst of the social unrest of the 1960s. Robinson's book and the discussions it engendered were not welcomed by the church establishment. In a speech following the publication of Honest to God, the Archbishop of Canterbury of the day went so far as to imply that the sorts of questions raised in Robinson's book should be discussed in the privacy of the church's back rooms among those who can handle them. He seemed to be suggesting that the public doesn't have the necessary brain power to deal with such matters, the ultimate in establishment arrogance and closed-mindedness. The perspective I gained as I stayed away from church brought my doubts into sharper focus, and other questions pushed their way forward. I couldn't stand the proselytizing just below the surface in most religions. Each religion considers its message to be the true message, and thus better than those of other religions. It seemed to me that Every society through the ages has searched for the meaning of life, and this has led them to conclude that there is a supernatural power watching over us. Then some charismatic leader turns up and puts it all together into a belief system that satisfies that particular group in society. The Agnostic The reason I describe myself as agnostic rather than atheist is that I don't know is a better fit for me than I'm certain. I believe that science can explain almost everything about our world, but not absolutely everything. I like it when scientists say, give us one founding miracle and we'll explain the rest. More recently, I was impressed by A Short History of Nearly Everything by Bill Bryson, in which he summarizes the major milestones of scientific discovery in the modern scientific era. Included in this are theories about the beginnings of the universe. Bryson's book makes these difficult concepts as accessible as anyone could, but he also makes it abundantly evident that there is much that we don't understand and may never understand. According to Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion, astronomers now believe that there may be as many as a billion billion planets, some of which are in the sweet zone, with conditions that can support life and where, in at least one of them, ours, life actually got started. Bryson describes the well-supported current theory that the universe emerged from a singularity some 15 billion years ago. The singularity contained everything, including space, time, heat, cold, 
darkness, past, future, gravity, you name it. Everything was in there. Then, in a brief moment, for reasons that no one understands, the singularity expanded into the universe as we know it, or don't know it, and here we are. I have a hard time thinking in a non-linear way, so I can't get away from the idea that there was a beginning which was probably also contained within the singularity, wherein something pushed the singularity start button, metaphorically speaking. Once the singularity expanded, the laws of physics took over and have determined what has happened since, including the creation of the whole universe and everything in it. That's the way I see it. There may indeed have been a supernatural force at the beginning of it all. It's as good an explanation as any, but as far as I'm concerned, that force is not directing our day-to-day lives. Here on Earth, we have an incredible variety of religions, faiths, and belief systems that claim to have the answers for us. They are all more or less deterministic, meaning that we don't really have freedom of choice. The more fundamentalist ones teach us to pray for the well-being of ourselves and our families, or our side in a war against another nation, or whatever the cause of the moment is. I find this puzzling. Why should our family or our side be favored in a war over other families on the other side, in the war, who are simultaneously praying for their side. Some sects of Christianity teach that God loves us, favors us, in fact, over believers of other faiths, although if they opt in, there's still a chance they can be saved. Yet at the same time, much older religions than Christianity are teaching similar things, and they in turn look upon Christians as misguided. We go out for a drive, but get killed when a drunk driver runs a red light. Family and friends talk about how unfair it is and ask what they did to deserve this. I don't think the question is valid. It's just bad luck, the result of eons of random happenings governed by the laws of physics that allow the drunk's car to crash into ours at that exact moment. Those with more fundamentalist belief systems say it was God's will, but my view is that there was no divine intervention in the tragic accident. Then there's the question of an afterlife. I believe that humans are part of the natural world, just one form of life among many others. Thus, if there's an afterlife in our future, there must be one for other living things, such as dogs, cats, snakes, mosquitoes, and bedbugs. I realize that it may be a rather unsettling thought to imagine standing behind a bedbug in the lineup for the Pearl Yates, but if you accept that humans and bedbugs are both part of the natural world, and that there's an afterlife, that's the conclusion that must follow. It doesn't mean that we have to be friends. I'm sure my readers will realize that I'm speaking metaphorically when referring to queuing for the pearly gates. I'm firmly in the ashes-to-ashes, earth-to-earth, and dust-to-dust camp. Finally, some research by Dr. Andrew Newberg and his team at the University of Pennsylvania suggests that humans may be hardwired to believe in God in the same way we are hardwired to procreate. This is not good news for me. Not only am I up against an entrenched church establishment that is resistant to change, but our very human brain insists that there must be a God. In fact, I have long suspected something along these lines, that human beings need a God, therefore we create one. This makes me even less convinced that there is a God. I consider it inherently illogical to suppose that God exists just because we need him, her, it to exist. Mind you, A few paragraphs ago, I admitted to the possibility of a supernatural being pushing the singularity button 13.7 billion years ago. I'm prepared to go that far. I'll join my fellow humans in imagining a deity of some sort pushing the singularity button. But since then, I think we've been subjected to the laws of physics. Here and now. I don't believe in an afterlife or a supernatural being directing us every step of the way, so if my life is going to count for something, it has to be in the here and now. Our society benefits from volunteers doing all kinds of good things. People do good work, serving on a charity board, visiting the sick, coaching little league baseball, fighting against abuse of women and children, advocating for justice for all, mowing an elderly neighbor's lawn, whatever it is. It is sometimes said that people do so in order to feel good about themselves. I think it goes deeper than that. I think there's a societal imperative whereby positive actions for the betterment of the community help society to function better. Humans are social beings who do better in cooperation with others than alone. 
If a member of the group is in trouble, the whole group suffers. When a member is helped to do better, the whole group does better. A recent book, The Spirit Level, Why More Equal Societies Almost Always Do Better, by Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett, argues that unequal societies are bad for almost everyone in that society. Their research shows that almost every modern social and environmental problem, ill health, lack of community life, violence, drugs, obesity, mental illness, long working hours, big prison populations, and more likely to occur in a less equal society. Many of us are driven to come to the assistance of a fellow human being who needs help. Most of us cannot stand idly by and let someone else suffer. The Wilson Pickett book takes it to another level. Our intuitive inclination to lend a hand at the individual level, when taken to the societal level, and indeed to the governmental level, produces benefits that radiate through the whole society. I've done a lot of volunteer work over the years without really thinking that there was a philosophy underlying it. The switch from working for the Prudential Insurance Company of America to the University of Saskatchewan Extension Division was more a pull than a push. The purpose of the division is to improve the lives of rural Saskatchewan people through the outreach of the university to the wider community. I agreed to become a member of the local committee of Canadian Crossroads International, CCI, and later served on the national board of CCI. That led me to become more involved with international development work and to my involvement in forming the Saskatchewan and District International Development Association, since disbanded. Then I was a founding board member of OneSky, the International Development Education Center in Saskatoon, and a founder of the Saskatchewan Council for International Cooperation. It's the reason my family and I joined CUSO, a Canadian international development non-governmental organization, for which we worked for more than two years in Botswana, and for which I worked for another 13 years after our return to Canada. Over the years, I have served on the boards of the Canadian Council for International Cooperation, Peace Fund Canada, and the now disbanded Canadian Seniors for Social Responsibility. I was a founding member of the Peace Fund Canada Foundation, member of the Board of Peace Brigades International Canada, and more recently, I've been involved with, with that scene and its village development project in Mexico. I believe that the only way the memory of me will live on will be through whatever contributions I've been able to make to my family and my community, as well as to the welfare of our global society. Father Bob. There's a spray can labeled bullshit repellent on my shelf. It was a gift on the occasion of my 50th birthday. Father Bob Ogle gave it to me with the advice, now that you're 50, you can call bullshit bullshit. I thought that was a fine idea, and although I occasionally use the word before receiving his advice, I have made a point of using it more frequently since then, out of respect for Bob, if for no other reason. I was going through a difficult patch at CUSO at the time, and used to put the can in front of me on the table pointing at my opponents in certain meetings. They didn't like it and didn't find it funny, which meant that I liked it and found it very funny. I first met Father Bob when he returned to Saskatoon in 1970, from six years working as a Catholic missionary priest among the poor in northeast Brazil. He walked into my office at the Extension Division, University of Saskatchewan, and asked me what was going on in international development. I told him, and he got involved. We worked together on a lot of good stuff in Saskatoon, including the formation of the International Learner Centre, called OneSky, and SCIC, the Saskatchewan Council for International Cooperation. Father Bob was a practical, politically progressive, and appealing guy. In 1979, he won the Saskatoon Humboldt Federal Riding for the NDP, beating out Otto Lang, a cabinet minister in Pierre Trudeau's Liberal government of the day. It was a huge upset. He won again in 1980 when Joe Clark's minority progressive conservative government was defeated. He was an effective MP and was referred to as the conscience of the House. However, the Vatican was not comfortable with priests being in Parliament and instructed him not to contest the next election. I expect part of the problem was that the Pope of the day was not keen on left-wing priests like Bob having such a powerful platform. Bob claimed not to be angry at being forced by his church to step down after only one term. I didn't believe him. Anyway, I was angry enough for both of us. Soon after that, Bob developed very serious health problems, including heart and blood disease. 
He wasn't expected to live very long, but in fact he didn't die for several years after that and kept saying that he would stick around doing the work he believed in as long as God wanted him to. Much to everyone's surprise, especially Bob's, he lived to celebrate his 65th birthday. He was very ill by then and didn't expect to continue defying the odds much longer. A celebration of life was held for him at St. Paul's Seminary in Ottawa, and when I went to wish him happy birthday, I was carrying the can of bullshit repellent. With a big smile, Bob said he remembered giving it to me when I turned 50, more than 11 years before. I said, well, I'm giving it back to you for your 65th birthday, and I want you to give it back to me when I turn 65. He asked, when's that? I said, 5 October 1997, not quite four years from now. He said, I might just make it. That, of course, is why I did it. I wanted him to have a goal to aim at, no matter how trivial. His health continued to deteriorate to the point where he spent the last months of his life in hospital in Saskatoon. His sister, a nurse, cared for him day in and day out. Still, a few days before my 65th birthday, a parcel arrived. It was from Bob in his hospital bed, mailed by his loving sister with a note written in a shaky hand, wishing me a happy 65th birthday. He died the next spring, 1 April 1998, at, a, at the age of 69. I must be the only person in the world for whom an aerosol can of bullshit repellent bought in a joke shop has such sentimental value. Postscript. Having a friend like Bob Ogle made me think, albeit fleetingly, of joining the Catholic Church, but then I realized it would need a much bigger can of bullshit repellent. The Caregiver My mother, who died in 2001, spent the final two years of her life in the Glebe Center, the nursing home near our Ottawa home on Wilton Crescent. One day, son Kevin and I walked over to visit her. As we passed by the doors to the dining room, on the ground floor, one of the harried staff asked if we could escort Mrs. Whatsett, possibly not her real name, up the elevator and let her off at her floor, the fifth floor. I said no problem and pushed the buttons for floors five, Mrs. Whatsett's floor, and nine, Mum's floor. Floors two to five were for patients suffering from various kinds and degrees of dementia. People on the lower floors of this 12-story nursing home had more severe dementia People on the upper floors were higher functioning. We arrived at the fifth floor. The elevator doors opened, and I said brightly, Well, here's your floor. Mrs. Watson said peevishly, This is not my floor. I said, I think it is. I was told to let you off at five. She said, No, this is not my floor. Okay. I asked, Which is your floor? She said, Six. So I pushed the button for six. When the door opened, we went through the whole thing again. She then insisted seven was her floor, and became very annoyed with me for screwing things up, given her busy schedule and all. She wasn't satisfied with seventh floor either, so up we went again. We arrived at nine, my mother's floor, and I led the way out of the elevator, leaving Mrs. Watson behind, saying cheerily, Well, you're on your own. For all I know, Mrs. Watson is still riding up and down in that elevator, insisting that none of the floors is hers. Kevin has very diplomatically suggested that this particular episode will not look good on my resume should I ever apply for a job in a long-term care facility. The Visitor Given my expertise in dealing with Mrs. Whatsit above, you could be forgiven for asking how I got along visiting my own mother, who also had a level of dementia in her final years. The answer? Not very well. Mom was a very private person and did not adjust well to the nursing home. She wanted to be able to lock her door, but of course that was not allowed, because the staff had to be able to go freely in and out of the rooms as needed. All floors of that 12-story tower had the same layout. This was quite understandable, and the residents sometimes got off on the wrong floor and went to what they thought was their room, and it was actually someone else's. One day, Mum woke from one of her frequent naps in her chair to see another woman ruffling through the clothes in her closet, looking very confused. She didn't recognize any of the dresses. And on another occasion, a man came into her room, went into her bathroom, began sorting through her stuff, looking closely at her toothbrush as if he didn't recognize it. Mum was outraged at such occurrences and simply brushed aside my explanation that these people were a bit confused, that all the floors looked the same, and that they had made an honest mistake. In her view, it was appalling that the Glebe Center would allow criminals to live there. She thought the center should have higher standards. 
At one point, Mum began having dreams that seemed to her to be real life. On one occasion, she dreamt that a chap had dropped in to fix something, and they had had a very nice chat. Then later, still in the dream, she looked out the window and saw that the two of us were walking along together. She was very pleased to think that I had such a nice friend and asked me how I met him. How could I answer her? I could never lie to my mother. But what was I to do? I lied. But not very convincingly. Dementia or no dementia, she could smell a rat. I spluttered to a lame explanation. She gave me a quizzical look and I, and I felt like a kid that had been caught fibbing. Mum's hearing deteriorated over the last 15 or 20 years of her life. My sister took the lead searching for hearing aids to help correct the problem. They helped, but not much. Mum hated them. She wasn't very good at remembering to turn them on, adjusting the volume, or changing the batteries. One of the main things they seemed to produce was a whistling sound. The more technologically advanced they got, the better they worked, but the worse she was at handling them, so it sort of evened out. When I went to see her, the first thing I would do is get out her hearing aid and fit it into her ear so we could have a conversation at reasonable volume. Then one day I went to see her and went through my usual routine with the hearing aid, but she couldn't hear anything, nothing. I put fresh batteries in the hearing aid, still nothing. I had to spend the rest of that visit writing notes for her to read and respond to. She couldn't hear a word during that whole visit. But then the next time I went, Everything was as before. She could hear reasonably well with the hearing aid in place. Then about six weeks before her death, I went to visit her, walked into the room and said something and she replied. I said something else and she heard me very well without the hearing aid. She didn't need it for the rest of her life. We could carry on a conversation just as we had been able to 20 years before, before her hearing had started to go. I liked the experts in the field, neurologists, audiologists, etc., to give me an explanation of what happened on these two occasions. Failing that, I will offer my own technical opinion. Something in her brain went click. Paper bag. Our Kingston grandchildren ranged in age at the time from eight to 16. And one Sunday afternoon, their parents proposed that they all go to the new Star Wars movie. Ellen, who was 16 at the time, said she didn't want to, that it would simply be too embarrassing to be seen at a movie with her parents. Her mother said, but dear, you probably won't even see anyone you know. Ellen replied that it didn't matter. It would still be too embarrassing. <clears throat> when I heard about it, ever the problem solver, I called with a, a suggestion. I proposed that they get a paper bag, cut two eye holes in it, and have her wear that over her head so nobody would notice her. Apparently, my suggestion was not taken up. Sometimes my earnest attempts to be helpful aren't appreciated. Cup of Copper. For years, our daughter Jill was married to a fine francophone lad named Mark. In addition to all the other challenges involved in building a life together, Jill undertook to become fluent in French. She has done well with her second language. She continues to work on it and continues to improve. In the early days, however, she was not as fluent as she is now. Back then, her most difficult situation from a language point of view, was being at gatherings with Mark's family, where the French was rapid-fire, noisy, full of banter and Quebecois colloquialisms, and everybody talked at once. Jill was a bit nervous anyway, as the new kid in the family group, especially when she couldn't quite keep up with all the banter. Thus, she didn't want to say anything when Mark's mother, Yvette, handed her a cup of tea with a problem. It happened to be the cup that Yvette used to hold extra pennies when they got too heavy for her purse. The cup was one-third full of pennies, but Yvette hadn't noticed in the relatively dim light of the kitchen when she filled the cup with tea and handed it to Jill. Jill saw the pennies lying there below the surface of the tea, not to mention the fact that a fair bit of dust was bubbling up from down among the pennies. Drinking the tea was a fairly unappetizing prospect, but making a fuss was even less appealing. Jill didn't want to attract any attention, so she just sipped at the tea gingerly and tried to be unobtrusive. It didn't work, because at some point Mark said, How come you're not drinking your tea? And leaned over to have a look. He spotted the coins and immediately told everybody what was going on. At that point, the uproar got even louder, and there was a huge amount of teasing at Yvette's expense. From then on, whenever Yvette made tea, the family wanted to know if she would be serving pennies to Jill. Seems quite quiet there. 
I usually have at least one wakeful period during the night. Often I can be found doing the dishes in the wee hours. My darling wife says that anyone else would say they had insomnia. I see it as a good thing because of all the things I'm able to do when there's no one around to disturb me. It's 4.42 in the morning as I write this paragraph, for example. Sometimes being up in the middle of the night can be fun. Carol has a friend in Australia. They email each other to arrange suitable times to have long phone conversations and take turns at making the calls. They do this several times a year. Sydney, Australia, is across the international date line between 14 and 16 hours ahead of Ottawa, Canada, depending on time of year. So it used to take a bit of calculating to find a time suitable for both of them. Today it is a simple matter to check on the internet for the exact time, day, and date anywhere in the world. Back then, they sometimes didn't get it right. Thus it was that the phone rang at 2.45 one morning. I stopped doing the dishes and went to answer. I said hello and heard Jane's lovely lilt. Ken, it's Jane. How are you? Aha, I thought. She's got the time wrong. I should be able to have some fun with this. I said, great. Nice to hear from you. Is Carol there? She asked. Sure, I said. I'll get her. Just let me put you on hold. She's upstairs. I was telling the truth as far as it went. Carol, of course, was sound asleep in our bedroom two floors up. I ran up the stairs, shook her awake. I knew that she would never say no to a chance to talk with her dear friend, no matter what the hour, and I said, it's Jane, and handed her the cordless. Carol said in a very tender and loving tone, Jane, and they began a conversation. At some point, Jane, who was very intuitive, got a bit suspicious and said, it sounds quite quiet there, to which Carol said, it usually is at three o'clock in the morning, at which Jane shrieked and exclaimed, oh, that Ken, wait till I get my hands on him. She apologized and wanted to hang up. <coughs> Carol said, don't you dare hang up. I'm awake now, and I'd love to talk, so they did. Jane was mortified, and of course I'm kind enough to remind her from time to time of her phone call in the wee hours. Growing Enthusiasm Christopher, the eldest grandson of our dear friends Coralie and John Standing, was being married to Amanda in Fredericton, New Brunswick, and we were invited. The wedding and associated events went on for several days in various venues in and around Fredericton rehearsal dinner, and Sunday brunch at the home of the groom's parents, wedding in a beautiful little country church, reception in a big tent at the country home of the parents of the bride, altogether a delightful and happy occasion. The activities began to wind down on Sunday. People began taking their leave in dribs and drabs. Goodbyes were being said right and left as people were leaving to catch planes, heading back home by car, reluctant to have it all end, but knowing they had to get back to their day-to-day -day lives. It was at this point that my inability to keep track of who was related to whom, and who was married to whom, who was traveling with whom, and who lived where, etc., began to be exposed. After I said goodbye several times to a neighbor who lived half a kilometer away, wishing her a safe journey, etc., and about four times to another couple who I thought had left the day before, but who kept turning up yet again, I felt as if my face was going to crack from the smile I had pasted on. I said quietly in an aside to Kathy, the groom's aunt, that I was worried about whether some of these people might sense my growing enthusiasm each time I said goodbye to them. I thought this problem was unique to me in my muddled way of dealing with social situations. I didn't realize that I had struck a chord, because Kathy apparently went into the kitchen to tell her husband Keith what I had said, and had, but had to sit down and was un unable to speak for several minutes all the while not being able to laugh out loud because there was yet another group at the front door being said goodbye to. After everyone had left, including Carol and me, my sentiments on the matter of repeatedly having said goodbye got shared around the family and met with a surprising amount of understanding, if not sympathy. While there was general agreement that I was the most inept of all at keeping track of who was who, apparently my sentiments weren't quite as outrageous as I imagined them to be. Snow in Victoria. Old age and harsh winters eventually pushed my Aunt Jessie, Nee Evra, and Uncle Bob Scarth to move from their beloved Manitoba to the gentler climate of Vancouver Island. They bought a little house in Victoria and settled in. They missed Manitoba but truly enjoyed the easier climate and flowers blooming in February. My aunt joined various groups and they soon were part of the community with a range of friends and acquaintances. 
Among their acquaintances was a young couple in their 20s who had moved from England to Vancouver Island and had never visited other parts of Canada, not even the BC mainland. Aunt Jessie and Uncle Bob had traveled from one side of Canada to the other and had a wonderful collection of slides of their travels. Aunt Jessie offered to put a slideshow together some evening if they would be interested. They were. My aunt selected a nice group of slides representing their travels from east to west beginning in Newfoundland and west through the Maritimes, Quebec, Ontario, the Prairies, the mainland of BC, and finally Vancouver Island. The lights were turned down and she started the show, Newfoundland. The young couple said it was very interesting to see how rugged it was, but they were certainly glad they had chosen BC. They liked it much better. They said more or less the same thing about each part of Canada as the slideshow moved west. They got to Manitoba where my aunt, with great pride, showed them the wonderful community of Isabella where she had been born and raised and where she and Bob had raised their five children and where their beautiful and productive farm had been. The young couple said it looked like a very nice farm and an attractive area, but they liked BC much better. By this time, my aunt, a spirited woman with a quick temper, began to see red. The comments were essentially the same as the show moved west through Saskatchewan and Alberta. As the show moved into BC, Jesse slowed things down a bit, ostensibly to give the young couple a chance to study their own province in more depth but Bob could see that she seemed to be doing some sorting on the side. The young couple changed their tune somewhat as the show moved into BC. They said, ah, British Columbia, now we're really going to see something. Then they said, well, it's very nice. We like it better than the rest of Canada, but it's certainly not as nice as Vancouver Island. Fortunately, it was too dark for them to see the smoke coming out of my aunt's ears. Side note, it rarely snows in Victoria, and when it does, it's usually not much and melts within a few hours or a day or two at most. However, Victoria had had a freak snowstorm two or three years before, in which a blizzard dumped 30 inches of snow on the city. The snow stayed for a week, completely shutting the city down. So instead of showing them the expected beautiful views of gardens, flowering trees, the harbor, and the blue ocean, my aunt showed them six slides of Victoria buried under 30 inches of snow, then she shut off the projector with a loud click. There was a stunned silence, but finally the young couple said, well, I guess we deserved that, and took their leave soon after, considerably subdued. P as a weapon. A small black kitten arrived at our house in Saskatoon one summer day. We inquired up and down the street, but no one was missing a kitten, so we named her Hobo. She adopted us, and we reciprocated. Great little furry black cat, lots of sitting on laps and purring. Hobo was in the prime of life and well integrated into our household when we decided to spend two years in Botswana. We were wondering what to do with Hobo when, by happy opportunity, we were able to rent our house to young friends of ours. We had total confidence that not only would they care for our house well, but because they had good do-it-yourself skills, they would be able to cope with any house problems that might arise. They were also cat lovers and were willing to keep hobo. We reduced the rent accordingly. We thought it would be an ideal arrangement. The cat would stay in her own home with people who liked cats. We were wrong. It was a good deal for us, but it was a nightmare for them. Hobo did not settle in well. Our tenants had two Siamese cats who were very disdainful of lesser beings in general, and Hobo in particular. Hobo, on the other hand, was extremely resentful of these two pale, elitist upstarts invading her territory. There was much hissing and spitting whenever Hobo and one of the Siamese came face to face. Hobo found a very effective way of showing her displeasure. She would jump up on the stove at night and pee in one of the stove elements. Imagine coming down to the kitchen on a cold Saskatoon winter morning, turning on an element to make coffee, and being rewarded with the smell of burning cat pee wafting through the house. Sometimes Don Rieger, the man of the family, would be so outraged that he would toss the cat out into the snow, but they couldn't leave her out for long in 30 below weather, so he would bring her in and confine her to the basement. There she would get even by peeing in his toolbox. That cat made their life a misery. We will be forever indebted to them for p putting up with her for two years. But that wasn't the last time Hobo used P as a weapon. 
She didn't approve of being moved from Saskatoon to Ottawa either, and took to peeing in our stove elements to show her displeasure. Once when we had guests for dinner, and Carol had repaired to the kitchen to make coffee, the dreaded burnt cat pee smell began rising from the stove. Panic stations. Carol quickly closed the swinging door between the kitchen and the dining room, turned on the exhaust fan full blast, and opened the back door, hoping desperately that the guests whom we didn't know very well wouldn't notice. Hobo was an amiable, gentle, affectionate, and valued member of the family for so many years, but she had difficulty adjusting to living in another house in another city, or even with different people in the house she was used to. Buffalo Dog The time had finally come for the Moose Jaw Police to leave the past behind, symbolically at least, by getting new winter coats. Their buffalo coats had served them well. This was not a decision to be taken lightly. In fact, nothing about a buffalo coat can be taken lightly, particularly the weight on the wearer's shoulders. Buffalo coats, made from real bison hides, see below, were standard issue for police forces in the prairies, beginning with the Winnipeg Police in 1875. Nothing could keep out the cold of a prairie winter as well as a buffalo coat. A police officer, with his buffalo coat buttoned up, fur collar rolled up above his head, fur hat, fur mitts, and big winter boots, could stand outside for hours in the coldest winter weather and be warm as toast. By the way, the correct name for the big range ungulates of the prairies is bison, not buffalo. Buffalo is a misnomer, but no one ever refers to a bison coat so buffalo coat it will have to be. However, any time the officer was required to do more than just stand there or lumber slowly along the street, the buffalo coat became a problem. Moving quickly was impossible. A thief had merely to walk briskly away from the scene of the crime in order to leave the pursuing officer in the dust, a swirling snow more likely. In fact, only the strongest officers had the strength to even raise an arm to wave goodbye to the disappearing thief. But I digress. In the early 1970s, the Moose Jaw police were disposing of their old buffalo coats at bargain basement prices. A professor friend of ours could not resist the deal. As a big man, six feet tall and weighing perhaps 230 pounds, he needed one of the largest coats. When fully attired in his buffalo coat, fur hat, big fur mitts, he looked like, let's face it, a buffalo. In fact, the first morning he wore it to class, a student came up to him at coffee time and said, I hear you have a new coat, Dr. Ollie. Dr. O said, where did you hear that? And the student said, everywhere. Then at the end of the day, when he was riding down the crowded elevator from his eighth floor office, a voice from the back said, I thought the livestock elevator was at the rear of the building. But again, I digress. I better bring the dog into this or I'll have to change the title of this piece. We had a small dog named Pepper. She was not a smart dog. However, she made up for her low IQ by being generously endowed with psychological problems. The kid liked the dog. Carol and I were not so keen. The free Humane Society program, Give a Dog a Home, had not served us well this time, aside from the price being right. An encounter with Bob Ollie in his buffalo coat brought things to a head, actually to the other end of the dog's anatomy. Bob came to our door one wintry night and stepped inside. Pepper thought dog hell had arrived. She went totally berserk, running around in circles, behind chairs, up and down on the stairs, on and off the sofa, and on around and around again and again, yelling and peeing everywhere she went, most particularly on the living room carpet. It was a zoo, a zoo in which the main feature was dog pee everywhere. We placed an ad in the paper the next day, Free dog, friendly, not house trained, suitable for farm, preferably buffalo free. Another Pepper story. Notwithstanding the negative aspects of our life with Pepper, she did provide me with an interesting comparison of dog and cat brains while she lived with us. The story involves our two pets at the time, Pepper, the dog, and Taffy, the Siamese cat. The dynamic was that Pepper was friendly but not very bright, which when combined with Taffy's utter disdain for dogs in general, and for Pepper in particular, led to some rather violent encounters. Whenever Pepper approached the cat, Taffy would act as if Pepper 
not only was not in close proximity, but did not even exist. As Pepper approached, Taffy would continue to stare off into space for as long as possible. Invariably, Pepper would misinterpret this lack of reaction on Taffy's part as Taffy wanting to be friends at last. There would then be a fearful hiss and growl from Taffy, and Pepper would have to back off quickly to avoid having her nose shredded. One winter day in Saskatoon, Taffy was asleep in one of our basket chairs while the sunshine was streaming in through the living room window. Taffy's head was to her left as she slept. Pepper approached from behind on the right side of Taffy and put her nose gently on the seat of the chair. Taffy, facing in the other direction, didn't notice and continued to sleep. Thus encouraged, Pepper put one front paw up on the seat of the chair, no reaction. Things are looking up, thought Pepper, as she put her second front paw on the chair, no reaction. Maybe this is the day, thought Pepper. One hind paw went up onto the chair, no reaction. But just as Pepper was about to climb up beside Taffy, the cat awoke with an extremely extreme reaction. Pepper hurled herself back out of the chair to avoid being divided into several pieces. Time then stood still with Taffy glaring at Pepper and Pepper cowering at a safe distance, attempting to figure out what, for a dog with an IQ no higher than its dog dish, should have been a clear message. Pepper then began circling the chair, apparently unconvinced that the situation was hopeless. The action then unfolded as possible. Pepper circles the chair in a counterclockwise direction. Taffy glares at Pepper, following with her head until Pepper disappears to Taffy's left behind the chair back. Taffy continues to glare at the spot where Pepper disappeared from view. Pepper continues around on Taffy's right side and stops. Taffy continues to glare at the spot where Pepper disappeared from view. Pepper takes this non-reaction as a positive sign and begins approaching Taffy again, beginning the paw on chair routine. Taffy realizes with a start that Pepper is right beside her on the right and reacts in her usual violent manner. Pepper starts circling again and disappears behind the chair to Taffy's left. Taffy continues to stare at the spot where Pepper disappeared from view. Pepper comes around on Taffy's right side and stops, etc., etc., and the cycle continues. Pepper would have continued circling forever, but Taffy finally had enough and retreated to a less sunny but more peaceful spot. Taffy never did figure out that once Pepper disappeared on the left, the place to watch next was on the right. The cat's brain couldn't make the connection. Meanwhile, the dog's brain, this particular dog's brain, couldn't accept that Taffy really didn't want to be friends. Lansdowne Park Lansdowne Park is a 38.6-acre sports exhibition and entertainment facility centrally located in Ottawa. The land had been granted to the city in several parcels beginning in 1847. The site functioned originally as a municipal fairgrounds and for most of its history housed the Central Canada Exhibition. The exhibition featured agriculture and homemaking exhibits, a midway, and a music and entertainment evening show in the grandstand. In addition, Lansdowne Park has long been the primary sports facility in Ottawa, featuring a hockey arena and a stadium mainly used for football and other events requiring a sports field facility. In addition to exhibition space, Lansdowne Park has a number of significant buildings, including the Aberdeen Pavilion, built in 1898, and the Horticulture Building, built in 1914. Both have heritage designation. Our home in Ottawa for 32 years was only one city block from Lansdowne. It was a dominant feature of our district. Over time, the original purposes for which Lansdowne was developed became less relevant or were met in more up-to-date facilities elsewhere in the city. The facility became underused and fell into disrepair. Much of the site was paved over and used for parking during football games. Then, after a more modern stadium was built on the western edge of Ottawa, the old stadium was no longer needed for football and saw declining use. Soon after that, the south side stands of the stadium were declared unsafe and were demolished. In 2007, the Ottawa City Council opened an international design competition to help it decide what to do with Lansdowne. The community appreciated the city's approach and eagerly awaited ideas from the best designers in the world. A few months later, the community was very disappointed when the city dropped the international design competition in favor of a proposal from a newly formed group called the Ottawa Sports and Entertainment Group, OSEG. 
The principals in OSEG were three of the wealthiest developers in Canada. OSEG's proposal was to enter into a public-private partnership with the city for the development of Lansdowne. In late 2008, I saw an article about a citizens group organizing to oppose plans for redevelopment of Lansdowne Park in Ottawa. The chair of the group was June Creelman, who said that they were looking for volunteers who would be willing to help. I didn't like the sound of the plans for redevelopment of the site, so I met with June, explaining that I was a retired fundraising consultant who might be able to help with raising money. June invited me to join the group called Friends of Lansdowne, FOL. Little did I know that FOL would become a major preoccupation of mine for more than two years. FOL objected to the OSEG stroke city deal. The international design competition was cancelled. Then the city did not ask for competitive bids and sole sourced the contract to OSEG. This was in violation of the Ontario Municipal Board regulations, which stated that there must be competitive bids for any project that exceeded $60,000 in value. The community was also suspicious of the financial arrangements, which were presented as a series of waterfalls, whereby the revenue from Lansdowne would flow to the city and OSEG, the partners in the development. Not only would the city taxpayers be putting up the lion's share of the money by way of a loan to OSEG, but money would flow back to the city much later than to OSEG. In fact, it would likely be years, even decades, before the city would see any return of, let alone return on, its investment. The total estimated cost of the redevelopment of Lansdowne was $290.8 million, of which the city was to contribute $172.8 million. The city was to pay for rebuilding the stadium and a share of the underground parking. OSEG was to fund the commercial development as well as a share of the parking. The city was to retain ownership of the land. OSEG's revenue would come from the commercial and retail components that they built on the land. OSEG would pay off its debt under the waterfall revenue sharing formula. The city and OSEG staged several presentations that they called consultations. The city's idea of a consultation was to present the OSEG stroke city plans for the site and invite comments. There was no opportunity to present alternative approaches. This was what the international design competition was supposed to provide. We needed to raise money to pay for our lawyer, Stephen Schreibman. We used email and face-to-face -face asks. We also held a number of special events in order to motivate, inform, and entertain the FOL community. These events were held in the Mayfair Theater on Bank Street in Old Ottawa South. It was one of my most successful fundraising projects ever because the community was so responsive. Still, we raised much less than what was needed. Schreibman's firm allowed him to reduce his fee by 40%. We raised more than $340,000, but even this amount fell far short of what was needed. The project took much longer and was much more complicated than anyone could have predicted. For one of the Mayfair Theater events, I was persuaded to be part of an old men's chorus line. It did not go well. This is no reflection on our dance instructor, Patty Steenberg. She did her best, but sometimes there are limits to how much a teacher can achieve with a particular group of dunderheads. At first, I thought we were going to do fine, and even went so far as to ask, what if we get so good that it won't be funny? The others didn't think that was likely to be a problem. Then, with only days to go until the event, when I could see how untrainable we were, I observed that Pitiful wasn't very funny either. The others thought that this was much more likely to be a problem. When it comes to dancing, I can never get my feet to do what my brain tells them to do. I can't kick when I'm supposed to, or in the direction I'm supposed to kick, or step in time to the music. We rehearsed three times a week for a month with little or no sign of improvement. Apparently, the elderly men's chorus line was a scream to watch. The audience was treated to the sight of a chaotic, uncoordinated, and unsteady bunch of old geezers trying to dance the can-can. The men, especially this man, couldn't kick very high and were so tottery that those in the front row could be forgiven for fearing that one or more of us would fall off the stage on top of them. We couldn't even turn and kick at the same time, so there was a distinct danger that one of us would kick the next guy where he would prefer not to be kicked. To add insult to injury, an experienced women's chorus line, after rehearsing for a few minutes, came on stage and did the dance with polish and expertise, two words that were not associated with our performance. We didn't even have the excuse of being pregnant, as was one of the women dancers. Finally, our lawyer, Stephen Schreibman, 
asked how come we didn't invite him to be in the chorus line. I was stunned that anyone would want to willingly make a fool of himself like that. I think I told him he was too young. FOL's opposition to the Lansdowne deal was multifaceted. To begin with, cities should not hand over a piece of land worth possibly $100 million, although a city hired consultant assessed its value at just under $20 million to three of the wealthiest developers in the country. In essence, the taxpayers of Ottawa would be adding to the wealth of, a, of the already wealthy owners of OSEG. It was FOL's contention that Lansdowne should continue as a public space, as it had been for most of its history. It should not become just another shopping center. OSEG argued that Lansdowne would be unique with stores and services not found elsewhere in the city. In fact, Lansdowne doesn't offer much that is unique. It is just another upscale shopping center. I could write a lot more about my FOL experience, but perhaps this is not the place. There are times when we seem to be in the middle of the returns of the gong show. For example, the horticulture building had been given heritage status by the city of Ottawa, but the building stood where the ramp to the underground parking was to be built. So the city lifted its heritage designation long enough for the building to be moved, then put the heritage designation back on again. FOL and people involved in the heritage movement objected, but to no avail. In the end, I devoted two years of my life to the Lansdowne issue, including sitting through an Ontario Superior Court trial and a presentation to the Ontario Municipal Board. Our lawyer did much of the work pro bono. Meanwhile, the city is reputed to have spent well over $1 million in legal fees to fight us. We raised money from generous people, then the city used tax dollars to fight us.